All right. Um, I'd like to call to order the May 12th meeting of the North Dakota State Health Council. Miranda, would you uh, call the roll, please? Let's make sure we have a quorum. Birch. Here. Bruso. Bruso. He yes, is on present. The here. Here. Okay. Present. Deanstman. Here. Fedorchik. Fedorchik. Mm. Lenoy. Here. Poole. Here. Roars. Here. Sailor. Sailor. I'm here. And Wolf. Wolf. We have seven of nine present. All right. Um, are there any additions, changes, amendments to the agenda that the that you would like to see? Okay, hearing none, we'll go with the current agenda. Um, we have emailed to us the minutes from our previous meeting of, I believe it was February 24th. Has everybody had an opportunity to review those? Are there any changes, alterations to those minutes or a motion? Also move to approve, Dwayne, this is Jenny. This is Daryl, I will second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion over the minutes as presented to us? Hearing none, Miranda, will you roll call? Birch. Yes. Bruso. Bruso. Yes. <laughs> Deanstman. Yes. Lenoy. Yes. Poole. Yes. Roars. Roars. Yes. Sailor. Yes. Seven eyes, right. zero nays. All right. Minutes were approved. Um, the first thing, or the second item on the agenda are the state loan repayment programs. Kaylee Werner is going to uh, present those along with recommendations to us. Um, there was quite a long list of them, and I know that there were some updates. So um, for those who might have read the original set and not gotten to the updates, if there are significant changes you'd like to point out, please do so, Kaylee. I'm trying to get my camera on there. Okay, good morning. Um, so the first one that we're going to review um, will be the physician um, packet that we sent. Um, we... Um, we have four, um, there's three slots. The, the three recommendations, um, the four actually don't have the $100,000 worth of um, student loan debt. And so there was a remaining uh, 44 left over. So we would like to award um, uh, an additional physician. Um, so the first three are that uh, Dr. Chuma, from um, Williston. She's a family medicine doctor with um, OB background training. Um, the second one is a Dr. Leah Thompson. She's a psychiatrist from the North Dakota State Hospital. Um, and the third is Rachel, Dr. Rachel uh, Murrell. She's an OBGYN also in Williston. And then if possible, um, to award Dr. Tim Smith, who's a psychiatrist at uh, Prairie St. John's with the remaining 44,000 left over. Members, um, do you have any questions, comments? Hearing none, this might be the easiest loan forgiveness package we've gone through. Um, do I have a, a motion to uh, approve the four and if possible, or the three and if possible, the fourth, if funding is available and Kaylee can make it work? Here, I'll move. Bet. Was that Sailor that moved? No. 
It was Brousseau, I believe. Oh, it was Brousseau. He's on the phone, so he has a significant lag, so be a little patient with him. He's he's all the way in Arizona. I'll be there tonight. <laughs> so, we have a motion from Dr. Brousseau. Uh, Tyler Illinois, I'll second. Mr. Illinois seconded. Any other discussion? Hearing none, would you please call the roll, Miranda? Birch. Yes. Bruce Hill. Yes. Deanstman. Yes. Fedorchik. He's. Oh, that's right. Illinois. Yes. Poole. Yes. Brewers. Yes. Sailor. Yes. Seven eyes, zero nays. Okay. Um, next set, Kaylee. Um, the next one we're going to uh, run through is the the dental um, candidate. So the ones that we are recommending, we have three slots. Um, the first one is Dr. Katrina Goble. Um, second is Dr. Evan Enns. And the third is a Dr. Callie Anderson. Um, six applicants total. We had three from Bridging the Dental Gap, one from Goble um, Pediatric Dentistry in Bismarck and two in the rural locations. Um, so Dr. Katrina Goble is the pediatric um, dentist from Go um, Dr. Goble's office. Uh, Dr. Enns is one of the rural dentists, and so is Dr. Kelly Anderson. It's also a rural location. Okay, and bridging is for um, people who don't, uh, for the underprivileged, underserved, right? So Correct, yes, okay. yep. Are there any discussion from the members in their review of the packages and with the recommendations of to whom the funding goes. Wow, it's the first time we haven't had people talk about <laughs> other, or, okay. All right, is there a motion? This is Daryl, I would so move. Second. There's a second from Kristen. Any further discussion? Hearing no further discussion, may we have a roll call? Birch. Yes. Bruso. Bruso. You might be in a dead spot in the road. So call him again at the end. Dean Smith. Yes. Illinois. Yes. Poole. Yes. Roars. Yes. Sailor. Yes. And Bruce Hill. We just mark him as non voting. Yeah. Six eyes, zero nays, one non voting. All right. Kaylee, do you want to go on to the next? Yeah, we're going to move to the advanced practice providers. Um, we had only two applicants this year. We had a Leslie Kling and a Heather Snow. And sufficient funding to cover both. Correct. Yep. And they both satisfy areas of need. Correct. Yep. They do. We actually moved. We had a, an additional, so that third spot was not filled. There's three slots that um, are available. We moved that funding down to um, be able to fund an additional behavioral health um, individual. So that funding was moved down to um, seven slots now are open with the behavioral health. Okay. Any further questions, discussion? questions all right i'm so used to this being so competitive that's probably yeah. why we don't have so much conversation this time <laughs> is there a motion move to approve 
Move to approve by Kristen. I'll second. This is Jenny. Seconded by Jenny. Any further discussion? Hearing none, would you please call the roll? Birch. Yes. Russo. Deansman. Yes. Lenoy. Yes. Poole. Yes. Roars. Yes. Sailor. Yes. Bruso. Six eyes, zero nays, one non voting. We might have completely lost him. Who knows? So, yeah, so I, I think it's great that this is moving so easily. We're not having to discuss these the way that we normally do, like <laughs> Kristen said. But the bad side of it is you kind of like for the idea for it to be a little bit competitive and know there's a lot of demand for these, too. So um, that might yeah, be I'm something wondering to discuss if... it at the end, Kaylee. Well, I, I, I'm curious to know if part of the reason for a drop in in applications is that because you need a match for all of these, right? Yeah, you do. Um, so I wonder if that's I believe playing it. a role. Dental seemed to be the only one that was really significantly competitive. So, okay. Yes. Um, so the next. Or, is that it? Okay, so the next okay. one I have um, a psychologist for behavioral health. Um, we had four applicants. Um, we can award the we can award two, and so there was a um, Dr. Uh, Heather McConnell. She serves in Jamestown at SCHSC, and a Dr. Smith, uh, Kelly Smith. She serves in Fargo at SEHSC. Any comments or discussion from the council? Is there a motion? Also move. This is Jenny. We have a motion to approve the, the two recommended by staff. Is there a second? This is Daryl Wagon. This is Daryl seconds. Any further discussion? Would you please call the roll? Birch. Yes. Bruso. I see he's back on. Bruso? It's like he's trying. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think that was a yes. Yes, I got it. Dean Smith? Yes. Lenoy? Yes. Poole? Yes. Roars. Yes. And Sailor. Yes. Seven eyes. All right. Kaylee, okay, next one. Okay, this is our last group. Um, we had 33 uh, candidates for behavioral health. We can select seven um, with that additional funding moving down from the advanced practice. Um, group. So we ranked um, a, a Tiffany Stuckey, who's a licensed addiction counselor at the Northwest uh, Human Service Center in uh, Williston. Then a Kristen DeGrinia. She's a licensed master, master's of social work. Um, she's at the North Dakota Youth Correctional Center in Bismarck. Um, we have a Carly Freeman. She's a um, uh, LBSW. She's at the kids program in Dickinson. Um, Melissa Meggs, she's an RN, she's in Minot. Um, a Christy Miller, she is a uh, social worker in Hedinger. Um, Cassandra Hovitt, she's a licensed master, master social worker in Grand Forks. Uh, Chantel Kuntz, um, she's also a licensed master, master of social work in Dickinson. So those are our second seven recommendations. Are you good? Okay. 
I would say this was probably the biggest struggle to, I mean, there was definitely some that came to the top. I would encourage, and Kristen, I don't know if you do this, but, um, or I'm sorry, Kaylee, I don't know if you do this, but for some of these that did apply that may not get an award, do you encourage them to reapply? I do, yes. Yep, and Good. actually, actually one of those was an applicant from last year. Um, sorry, I'm just pulling up. It was uh, Melissa Meigs, our Meigs. She was she applied last year, um, and we encouraged her to apply again this year, and she did receive it or is recommended to receive. All right. Any other discussion or comments? Yeah, and these didn't come too far off from my read throughs of their files either. I mean, and normally you're your top seven or six or whatever always end up in my top 10 in, in most cases as you guys review these. And I was kind of, kind of the, the emphasis on what I think the legislative intent is on significant resources to the to the Western part of the states were state where we've had a lot of the issues. So it was nice to see those fall out that way. Um, well, and it just goes to show to the need of behavioral health. I mean, you know, this isn't something that you look at the dentist, we've had a few, you know, wasn't a lot of competition, but seeing we had over 30 apply for this really is um, showing the need that's out there. So I'm glad we're able to provide some assistance to, to these physicians and these folks. Any further discussion? Do we have a motion to approve? also move to approve the recommendations presented. Do we have a second? This is Tyler Illinois, I'll second. All right, we have a motion and a second on the table. Any further discussion? Miranda, would you please call the roll? Birch. Yes. Bruce Hill? I saw a bit ago that he left the meeting. Deansman? Yes. Fedorchik? Lenoy? Yes. Poole? Yes. Roars? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Six eyes, zero nays, one non voting. All right, um, Kaylee, were there, I don't think there were any others, were there, or is there another set? No, that was it. We just have one um, that is a, a previous awardee. Um, she was awarded last year that has moved locations and would like to continue in the program. And so um, if we could just discuss her okay. really briefly. Um, uh, Rebecca Coos, she's a nurse practitioner. Um, she, when she signed the contract, she was with, or excuse me, when she was awarded, she was at Sanford. Um, she started her own private practice last year in June. Um, and so she's been practicing at her, her private practice in Fargo. Um, she's still taking Medicaid, Medicare, um, and would like to continue in the program. Um, I, we just got an email from her on Friday. I believe you should have received her, um, her letter in the, packet um the contract so she had left sanford on 6 12 20 of last year she signed our contract on 6 18 20 last year so her matching sponsor was not the matching sponsor at the time she signed the contract then correct and we're still trying to get information sanford was the one that paid was the one that paid the match that timing seems somewhat suspect yes what are the will or comment of of this council can you help us understand, Kaylee, what are our options? So our options are to deny her request of transfer? Correct. Is yes. there a 
pause and wait for more information? Like no further money goes out until we get more information? Is that a middle step option or not, a, not an option? Kristen, this is Brenda Wise, um, yeah. the Chief Financial Officer. And from the perspective of funding um, for those contracts, they are always paid after a year of service. So she's scheduled for a payment in June here. And we have until the 30th to make that payment and that decision um, before the biennium closes. And so um, whatever you decide will kind of trigger whether she gets that payment or not. It's always yeah. paid after the year of service. Okay, that's what I was wondering was on the yep. timing. Thank you, Brenda. You're welcome. Brenda, this is Dwayne. On the match side of it then, as having gone independent, how does the match side of this then work? So if Sanford has already provided, <clears throat> excuse me, the full match, then I feel that we would adequately have um, contributed towards that requirement as defined by the Century Code. Of course, um, Sanford mm -hmm. has to be comfortable with um, the money that they provided for this individual for loan repayment um, after they've left. I think that's something that has to be worked out. I'm not sure if this individual will have to return the match. If that's the case and the match is, let's just assume um, one scenario that Sanford would ask for the match back, then this individual would have to obtain match from the community some sort of way. Brenda, the match couldn't come from her private practice though, correct? That's correct. According to the Century Code, it has to be um, within the community or within um, someone who is, if I understand Century Code correctly, it's from that community because we're enhancing that community and contributing to that community and want them to have buy-in as well. Now, Sanford might be okay with leaving the match the way it is based on years of service previously, um, but that's something we'd have to determine as well. I think for now, we don't have enough information to be able to make a, uh, an informed decision. In my opinion, um, it would be good to know what Sanford's wishes are and, and how they would plan to move forward. And even though, would the match be for the entire time period or just on an annual basis? Because I'm thinking if, they, if she left, they may do a match for the first year, but I can't imagine why they would continue to do the match if she's no longer employed there. Yeah, um, I think the interesting thing about this, if I understood the dates correctly, is that she actually left prior to signing that contract. And I don't believe she had years of service before that. This is her first year, is that correct, Kaylee? Correct, yeah. So I, I'm, I'm a bit concerned that she signed a contract to say she'd be working at Sanford when in fact she'd already established her own practice. And so if Sanford was going to match, they didn't even, that individual didn't provide service under Sanford. I think the tough thing for us is the timing is we would need to have, you know, some kind of decision made by June 30th if we do intend to pay her because our appropriation ends at that time, whether to pay her or not. I, I think it's incumbent on her to, to basically bring a, a letter of support to supply the match from the community or somewhere else or showing that Sanford is willing to continue on their end, which I doubt. Would, would an option be for us to approve contingent on that letter of support and otherwise deny? Yeah, on that letter of match commitment, yeah. Yep. I would, um, I don't, I'm sorry if I'm speaking out of turn. I would appreciate that from an appropriation standpoint. That would help us greatly and then wouldn't require us to reconvene the group. Kristen, would you like to make that a motion? That was exactly what I did. I made a motion. <laughs> <laughs> I'll second that with the story. The motion is second. Any further discussion? I do have one additional question, Dwayne. Um, Keely, with her going into private practice, I'm assuming that she's still meeting all the requirements of who needs to be serviced as far as Medicaid patients and the like, correct? Correct, yes. Okay. okay. Any further questions or discussion? Hearing none, Miranda, would you please call the roll?
Brandon, Birch. call the roll. Oh. Yes. Bruce Hill. Dean Smith. Yes. Lenoy. Yes. Poole. Yes. Roars. Yes. Sailor. Yes. Six eyes, zero nays. Okay. We'll also join the, the call. Is there any First further? Call. I'm sorry, did you say that someone else joined the call? Yeah, Dr. Wolf has joined the meeting as well. Oh, okay. Would you like to vote on that last motion? Uh, yes. Okay. Answered yes. All right. Seven eyes, zero nays. All right. Is there any further discussion with Kaylee at this point or anything else Kaylee would like to, to say with regard to the program? I think that's it. Thank you for your time this morning. Thank you, Kaylee, for leading these groups and these efforts that evaluate these. You're welcome. Okay, it's item number three, the newborn screening program. Joyle. Good morning, Chairman Poole and members of the State Health Council. My name is Joyelle Meyer, and I'm the Newborn Screening Program Director for the North Dakota Department of Health in the Division of Special Health Services. Newborn screening is considered one of the greatest public health achievements of the 21st century. Newborn screening is a blood test that screens for certain rare and metabolic disorders, and North Dakota requires law, law requires that all babies be screened. However, the parent and guardian may object to the testing after written information. So North Dakota Century Code for the State Department of Health, Chapter 2301, 03.1 newborn screening, newborn metabolic and genetic disease screening test states, the State Health Council adopts rules relating to the storage, maintenance, and disposal of blood spots or other newborn screening specimens. And the Health Council shall specify a panel of metabolic diseases and genetic diseases for which newborn screening must be performed. The screening panel must include disorders and diseases selected by the State Health Officer with input from an advisory committee that is approved by the State Health Council. In addition, North Dakota Century Code for the Testing and Treatment of Newborns, Chapter 25-1705, Testing Charges States, a screening and confirmatory diagnostic testing laboratory may charge fees for necessary services. I am here today to request approval by the State Health Council for the North Dakota Newborn Screening Program to add screening for spinal muscular atrophy or SMA effective September 1 of 2021, which includes a fee increase and approval of the Newborn Screening Advisory Committee minutes, committee members. So spinal muscular atrophy is a rare neuro neuromuscular disease that occurs in about one in 11,000 births and one in 50 Americans are genetic counts carriers. SMA is characterized by weakness of skeletal and respiratory muscles. It is caused by a loss of specialized nerve cells that control movement. SMA was added to the National Recommended Uniform Screening Panel in 2018. The North Dakota Newborn Screening Program has an agreement with the University of Iowa to process North Dakota newborn screening specimens. And on February 26 of 2020, the State Health Council approved North Dakota to participate in a pilot testing phase for SMA. The SMA pilot testing began July 1st of 2020 for babies born in Iowa and North Dakota. As of May 7th, 2021, the State Hygienic Laboratory has screened 31,732 babies from Iowa and 10,096 babies from North Dakota. One baby from Iowa has been confirmed to have SMA. There are, there are several F FDA approved treatments for SMA. The best results for treatment are noted prior to symptom development. Newborn screening is the most effective and efficient when babies with SMA have access to timely treatments and available supports. The current cost of newborn screening fee is $96. And with the addition of SMA to the newborn screening panel, there will be a $13 increase for a cost of $109 per baby effective September 1st of 2021. This fee increase includes cost for equipment, facilities, staff, and information technology. Newborn screening is covered by insurance and is typically included in the diagnostic related group 
or DRG when a baby is born. If adding SMA to the North Dakota's newborn screening panel is approved, the newborn screening program will collaborate with the State Hygienic Laboratory to inform North Dakota facilities and insurance companies about the fee increase. And then I have in the testimony there a couple of references to links for the SMA fact sheet uh, from Cure SMA, and then we have a, a state fact sheet as well. Uh, in addition, the Newborn Screening Advisory Committee represents the interests of North Dakotans to assist in developing programs that ensure availability of and access to quality genetic health care services by all, by all residents. And this committee advises the Newborn Screening Program and makes recommendations about the design and implementation of the program. In addition, the committee evaluates the addition of new disorders that may be added to the Newborn Screening Panel as approved by the State Health Council. Since the committee members were last approved in 2018, there have been some additions and deletions of members, and hence I am requesting approval for the new members that are highlighted in yellow on the attached document that you uh, received. Those, have, those that have left their positions have a line through their name and will be removed with your approval of the new members. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have at this time. Joya, how many births do we have in North Dakota a year? You know? So it's actually, uh, Chairman Poole and members of the committee, it's actually uh, decreased over the past five years. And so um, the lab actually had calculated about 12,793 births. That's the average of the previous five years. But in 2020, we had 11,623 specimens um, received. And so there may be a few more uh, specimens that are from babies that are born in other states. Um, mm -hmm. So, but the, the last five years, we've had kind of a steady decline of. Uh, I was just thinking with that one in 11, one in 11,000, I was just curious how many we would anticipate yep. to catch and, and be able to start treating earlier. So about one baby uh, a year, but that it's, means a lot. Yep, to it seems, parents, so, yes. So uh, the, a question as well, and, and maybe I should know the answer to this, but um, two things. Does Medicaid and do Medicaid and Medicaid expansion pay for this testing um, as well? You said insurance companies do, but does that mean Medicaid and Medicaid expansion out as well? Chairman Poole, Representative Birch, yes, it does. Uh, Medicaid, we've worked really closely with them to make sure that the, the testing is actually um, paid for. And that's when, when a baby is born in the hospital, they have that diagnostic uh, readiness, diagnostic related group, the DRG. So that cost for the testing is rolled up in that fee. And so we've worked with Medicaid as well because the um, making sure that the treatments are covered by Medicaid. And so um, there are three FDA approved treatments at this time for, um, for SMA. And so we've worked really closely with them to make sure that that is uh, going to be paid for as far as the treatment. And we actually were just notified um, Dr. Miles is, is on the line. He's one of our pediatric neurologists. And we have currently have a child that's just going to turn two years old um, that has some um, that was just identified with SMA and uh, they're in need of um, Zogensma and you have to have that received by the two years old. And so um, we've been working with Medicaid to make sure that that child will receive treatment by the age of two, which has been a pretty big effort in the last week. So. Any further questions or discussion on the two items that we need motions on? First is to add the, the SMA to the screening panel. And the second is for the additions to, and deletions from the advisory committee. No, I just wanna mention, I had actually reached out to, I think Joel, probably two years ago already, asking about whether we did have SMA or what it would take to cover it and you were already working on it. So I'm, I'm glad to yes. see this kind of working its way through the process. So thank you for your diligent work on that. And therefore I would move that we approve SMA as an addition to the new board screening panel. Do we have a second? I would second, this is Daryl. We have a motion of second to approve SMA. Any further discussion? Miranda, would you please call the roll? Birch. Yes. Bruso. Deanstman. Illinois. Yes. 
Pool. Yes. Roars. Yes. Sailor. Wolf. Yes. Okay. We have seven yeses, zero noes. Okay. Do we have a motion on the amendments to the newborn screening advisory committee? I just have a quick question, Joya. How do you find members to join it and how do you decide? Are there like terms or how does that work? Uh, we actually uh, do, we try to do annual visits and that's been hindered kind of with the, with the COVID um, pandemic. And so we actually reach out to the nurse managers and kind of just try to find that one champion at the hospitals. And so we do have representation. We have quite a few members, but we have representation from all of the hospitals, the birthing hospitals. And so there's 12 in North Dakota. And then we have, make sure to have parents involved, um, family voices, those parent, those advocate groups and uh, physicians, all of our specialists. We have our Iowa partners as well that um, are from the state hygienic lab and short term follow up. And so we actually kind of seek them out. And if there's people that are interested, then that's, you know, they're, they're welcome to join. So. And maybe a question along those lines as well. You have quite an extensive list here. Is there pretty good participation from those members that are listed? Yes, we actually do. Um, we have probably, I would say, between 40 and 45 members that participate on a, we have a quarterly meeting. And so we do have pretty good participation. It's impressive with a group that large. <laughs> Thank you. Any further discussion on uh, the changes to the advisory committee membership? Dwayne, I would move to approve the recommended changes. Thank you, Daryl. Do we have a second? I'll second. This is Jenny. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Miranda, would you please call the roll? Birch. Yes. Russo. Deanstman? Yes. Lenoy? Yes. Poole? Yes. Roars? Roars? Yes. Sailor? Yes. Wolf? Wolf. I saw he tried to say something. Can you repeat that? Yes. Okay. Seven yeses, zero noes. All right, motion passes. Joel, thank you very much. We appreciate all the efforts that, that you go to on this. Thank you so much. All right, next on the agenda is item number four. That's an update from Tim Wiedrich on the Medical Services Division. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the council, I'm Tim Wiedrich, I'm section chief of the Health Resources and Response Section uh, with the North Dakota Department of Health. And uh, if I've done this correctly, I am about to share, uh, well, uh, well, my screen is telling me I'm about to leave this meeting, which isn't at all my intent. Uh, am I still with you? You're still with us. All right, I will just uh, uh, press forward then. Um, give me one more uh, click here to see if I can get my team's screen back. Um, I'll just proceed. Uh, I'm not able to see you currently, uh, but in any event, um, uh, as a Section Chief for Health Resource and Response, today I'm going to be going through kind of highlighting some uh, high-level uh, COVID response activity that this section uh, is doing within the health department. Uh, and so uh, with this very first slide, I just wanted to lead off with uh, the uh, explanation of the two photographs that you're seeing in the opening slide. On the upper right-hand side, this is a rest area near Drayton uh, that was set up primarily to service 
truckers coming in from Manitoba into North Dakota uh, on a routine basis. It's been up for roughly about five or six weeks. Uh, and uh, in the last two weeks, we've vaccinated 424 truckers at that uh, location. Uh, we're there for three days uh, out of the week for about six hours a day. And so that's the availability in the uh, late afternoon, early evening hours as truckers come and go uh, from the Canadian border. Uh, since that time now, two additional, uh, what we refer to as pop-up sites have been established. Uh, one in Kenmare uh, for the uh, truckers coming out of Saskatchewan. And then we have also established one in uh, Riska, uh, which is one of the busier rest areas uh, for uh, truckers within North Dakota. Uh, so in the last two weeks, putting all that together, uh, there have been 509 uh, persons that have been vaccinated through that process. The lower left-hand photograph you're seeing is what we call a procedure trailer. It's uh, basically some of our staff intermingled with some of the truck drivers. Uh, they step into the, the procedure trailer, receive the vaccination, and then uh, they'll sit outside, as you see, with the folding chairs for 15 minutes while we observe to make sure that there's no uh, adverse reactions, uh, and then they get back in their trucks and drive on. Uh, we'll talk in a little bit more depth uh, regarding this uh, on my next slide. Um, and that is the staffing from this uh, comes from the staff that are both full-time and part-time temporary staff. Uh, and so on this slide, you can see that we have a variety of uh, providers, uh, nurses, EMS providers, couriers, certified nursing assistants, and so forth. Uh, and we have 162 currently that are uh, full-time uh, engaged in this activity. Uh, and then we have 181 part-time. Um, obviously, the part-time folks uh, don't provide as many hours because of some of the difficulty around their availability. For the most part, these are providers working at other medical institutions that, that may be working uh, for us part-time as well. Uh, and so most of the activity comes from the full-time staff. Uh, we currently have 343 of these temporary workers. Uh, our peak during the COVID response is just under 450. Uh, and so that number will continue to diminish in the last two weeks we uh, had uh, three uh, of the full-time staff that have left us and five of the part-time staff that left us and uh, i see that as a natural attrition uh, as our operating uh, tempo continues to diminish you know, we obviously are very concerned about some of the uh, variant uh, strains that are that are happening, and so we don't want to lose this capacity or this capability uh, in the event that things uh, re-escalate and that uh, that we don't have a, the necessary workforce to uh, address it. Uh, but to be really blunt, if we don't have work, then these folks don't get ours. Uh, and so right now, I think we've maintained a, a good mix of keeping uh, them busy enough to keep them uh, doing important work, as you'll see here in a moment, um, and still being able to maintain this uh, this workforce. Uh, so talking a little bit more about you know the missions that they're actually doing, if we uh, look at this uh, slide between uh, the, uh, the 29th of last month and the 12th of this month, so roughly a two-week time period, uh, we had 524 what we call staffed missions. So this is a single staff member doing a single shift. And where those uh, times have been invested uh, are doing, we actually have what I would say are five main missions right now. Uh, those deal with the provision of vaccinations uh, to do testing. Uh, to fill gaps in uh, medical institutions and long-term care. So hospitals, long-term care, are primarily where gap filling has occurred in the past. Uh, and then fit testing for the PPE uh, that's necessary to keep the, the workforce, uh, the public health and medical workforce protected. Uh, and then finally, medical material storage acquisition and distribution. So those are the five main areas. And with this slide, what you're seeing is that we're doing PCR testing, uh, in substantial quantities, both in the long-term care uh, facilities and also within the community in general. Uh, uh, PCR testing are, are a type of, of test where swabbing occurs and it comes into our state lab and 
looking for RNA as part of that process. Then we have Binex testing, uh, which um, is, uh, you can see, mostly happening in long-term care currently, very right? little of that happening within the community within the last two weeks that we've assisted with. And um, that's a, an antigen uh, test uh, it's, it's done. And then we had mixed test sites. Uh, so that's the testing capability. A lot of testing is happening without our staff, and that's as it should be. So uh, long-term care in many situations are providing their own staff to do this. Local public health uh, are involved in these missions as well. Hospitals doing their own testing as well. So we basically supplement where there are shortages of staff uh, with the missions that you're seeing. Uh, Vaccination is the same, uh, that we're providing a uh, a service uh, wherever it's needed when there are additional vaccinators that are needed. Uh, and uh, we have roughly of the staff that we uh, previously spoke about, uh, about 100 people that are in a position to actually assist uh, in delivery of the vaccine, actually doing the shot, so to speak. Uh, but I do want to spend just a moment talking about a, a bit of a shift about where we're going. We've come through a, a, a process where we've been supporting um, clinics that have done pretty high volumes for the most part. And now we're shifting to these pop-ups uh, in an effort to go to where uh, people that are not uh, particularly driven to get the vaccine, uh, that are highly motivated to get it. Uh, and so uh, these pop-ups are an attempt to bring the vaccine to where people can, as a matter of convenience, uh, acquire it. And uh, we began doing some pilot testing with some of the big box stores like Walmart uh, to see if that would attract people that wouldn't otherwise make an appointment with a provider or go to a local public health unit and then conducted some surveys. And we found that that in fact uh, was successful. And so uh, we're now looking at uh, assembling roughly 14 teams initially of two person vaccinators uh, to go into you know, very small uh, locations set up temporarily, capture what we can capture from those, uh, and then, you know, move on to the, to the next locations uh, so that we can try and get uh, those individuals that uh, are willing to receive the vaccine but may not be willing to take the necessary steps to do other more traditional mechanisms of, of receiving the vaccine. Uh, so that's a pretty significant effort that we're, that we're moving forward. We're going to start with 14 of these teams, as I said, and move them up to 28. Uh, they'll be under the uh, control of local public health uh, from the perspective of local public health can, uh, can include them uh, or do their own staffing, uh, or we can just you know, run it uh, independently of local public health, but under the cooperative, under the cooperation of local public health, and also to be able to kind of direct where within their jurisdictions uh, they would like these these pop ups to be occurring. So that's a, an effort, as I said, that's moving forward. Fit testing is necessary because uh, our uh, while we were very fortunate to have. Be the, the vision to have a warehouse and to have acquired the medical material uh, that gave us PPE uh, in sufficient quantities to move us through this emergency. Uh, and unlike uh, many states that did not have that level of preparation, we didn't suffer the acute shortages uh, because it simply was impossible to acquire the necessary PPE at the time of the emergency. And so that's why, as you were seeing, shortages across the rest of the country uh, states like like ours, uh, where we had a necessary medical cash available, did not suffer those those same stresses, and we were able to provide necessary PPE to both public health and medical providers as part of this response. But even in terms of our processes, we had to make a shift away from what we have traditionally used for things like N95 masks, which have to be fit tested. That's labor intensive, uh, costly and time consuming. Uh, in the middle of the emergency, uh, as our stores started to diminish, we had to shift to another form of N95 mask that's requiring fit testing. Uh, and in fact, what we normally stock and what the vast majority of the state is fit tested towards still won't be available even even under today's circumstances uh, until uh, October of um, 
of this this coming year. So uh, you can see that there are still while there are N95 masks available now, uh, as an example, uh, some of the very specific ones and more popular ones uh, are not still available and still have some considerable backlogs. So that's requiring us to do fit testing uh, of a number of, of, uh, of medical staff across the, the state. And then finally, gap staffing. Uh, we've uh, seen that those missions have dropped down to absolutely uh, almost nothing at this point, uh, fortunately, uh, because uh, we're not having the substantial outbreaks that we were having earlier. Uh, within within facilities. In terms of carrier missions, uh, the medical uh, distribution process, uh, we're distributing uh, as a single day's example. Yesterday, there were test supplies delivered to 22 sites, vaccine to 20 sites, specimen uh, picked up or delivered at 29 sites, and then we also have other medical supplies that are part of that. So uh, 71 carrier missions yesterday. Uh, and for warehouse missions, these are where we're not delivering by courier, but uh, utilizing third party uh, distribution like US Postal or, or FedEx or so forth where that's appropriate. Uh, you can see where we had uh, PPE orders, that's personal protection equipment. Uh, the number of cases that were, that were sent as a result of those orders. Uh, Binex uh, test kits that have been ordered, uh, which are the antigen tests that we talked about earlier. Uh, and so, uh, so the warehouse continues to be very uh, busy doing uh, those types of deliveries as well. Uh, and uh, I want to start to close out now by just quickly talking about hospital availability. We're continuing to watch this closely. As, uh, uh, as of recently, we have uh, 34 staffed ICU beds that are available within the state. We have 325 uh, additional uh, general acute care beds that are available. Uh, and so uh, you know, we are certainly not in any type of a shortage. Um, uh, and uh, and that we have 41 that are uh, hospitalized with COVID uh, currently. Uh, the final piece before I open it up for your questions is uh, where we're at with the PPE uh, supplies that we have primarily surrounding COVID. Uh, and I was talking about this uh, very early. And for the most part, uh, we've been able to restore now back to the same quantities and in some cases even more uh, than what we had pre-COVID. So uh, surgical masks, uh, we have a little bit uh, over 2.7 uh, million that are available to us in our in our warehouses. Uh, we have uh, the N95 respirators and I'm gonna drill down uh, in a little bit of detail here. Uh, you'll see the total at the bottom of that column uh, 1 million and change. We started the COVID emergency with 1.4 million uh, of these N95 respirators. So we've not quite caught that up yet, uh, but you can see that, uh, that we've got a variety of uh, respirator types. The only ones that were predominantly fit tested for within our state are the 1860s. So if we, as we've moved into the 1870s, that's out of necessity because the continued unavailability of the 1860s were forcing medical systems, public health systems, long-term care, uh, basically to get fit tested uh, and uh, uh, in order to utilize these masks, which is important. Uh, having this greater diversity, I think will actually uh, be better for us in the long run. The KN95 respirators, we don't include in the totals because those are strictly available because of emergency use authorizations are not normally part of the medical response system. And as long as we have uh, quantities of the traditional N95 respirators, we don't use the KN95 respirators. Uh, those are primarily a, a, a Chinese standard manufactured in China. And, uh, uh, and so uh, again, uh, those are not something that we really include as part of our mix. Uh, goggles, uh, 22,000 gowns, uh, 1.1 million, and uh, gloves, a little over 5 million were set very well for those. And face shields were uh, a little over 1 million uh, there as well. So uh, in general, I think that we're in, in, in a strong position. We have the majority of our uh, restorations uh, back in place for personal protection equipment to protect the workforce. So I'll stop there and see what questions or comments you may have for me. So Dwayne, if I could ask a, a question. 
Jim, of, of the replenishment that you've done in the, in the cash, have you been able to use the federal funds to replenish that inventory so that those that were burdened um, would need to order from, from the cash don't need to repeat those? Or how, how does that replenish? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I really appreciate the question. I actually intended to cover it and failed to. Uh, the uh, cash was originally built almost exclusively with federal funds uh, through the life of the hospital preparedness program and the, and the public health emergency preparedness response program. So those are all 100% federally funded. Uh, we had about $2 million worth of pharmaceuticals that have been uh, were appropriated by the legislature for uh, for uh, 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 for uh, for flu response, um, but uh, the vast majority again was federally funded to create it, and uh, it's almost all exclusively federal funded in terms of these restorations as well. Uh, and uh, so we hope to emerge on the other side of this once once we're all said and done to have the medical cash restored uh, back into as strong of a position, if not stronger, uh, and to leverage the federal funds appropriately uh, to do that. And then whatever state funds are available to uh, to assist with that process as well. Uh, Mr. Weedrick, this is Tyler Lanoi. Um, say with the, with the pop-up events that you guys are holding, whether it be at the grocery stores or the Walmarts or whatever, um, how have you guys, how have you guys figured or what have you found as far as a second dose vaccination rate has been on these people? And like, do you try to do a pop-up at that same facility in 21 days or 28 days? Or what do you see the reuptake of the second dose has been? Yeah, the, thank you for the question. And philosophically, uh, while we want that second dose to occur, there's, there is benefit from just having the first dose. Uh, but we intentionally reschedule availability back at those locations so, so that if those that receive their first dose at a location will have the opportunity when the timing is 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 right to obtain a second dose at those same locations uh, but there's there's not you know, a process where we're trying to aggressively force them back in uh, and they can avail themselves to a wide variety of other locations to get those second doses uh, uh, so they're not tied to us uh, at that point either um, yeah. Yeah, our, our surveys basically said, when well, we asked why, what was it about our pop-up site, a very small survey, unscientific, but what is it about our pop-up sites that made you get your vaccine today uh, when you hadn't done it, you know, but we were more tactful in this, but when you hadn't done it with all the other availability, and it really centered around, for some, a continued misunderstanding in terms of the um, availability of the vaccine. Uh, and so the fact that it was there, where they were at, if they were a big box store or wherever, uh, and that it was available right then, they didn't have to make an appointment, they could just walk on. There's continuing to be a misunderstanding in terms of that it's free. Uh, and so even though people are insured and that their insurance is covering it, when, we, when we're delivering it in this format, there is no insurance uh, processing. And I think that there's still some people that are believing that somehow they end up paying it, even though it may be covered by insurance. So those two are the main motivator fact, motivating factors for people to, to get the vaccine that's available now, it's it's convenient to their location and that it's free. Thank you. Tim, I, I would just like to make the comment that, you know, having watched you and your program over more than a decade now in my particular case, um, the strategic stockpiling, the management of, of that particular program, how you set that infrastructure up and how kind of true to the spirit of preparing a state for the inevitable, um, you and your, your division stuck to um, really showed in North Dakota's case compared to other states as, as this came upon us. And I appreciate that. Well, thank you so much for those kind words. I'll certainly pass that on to, to staff and, and appreciate your and the health council's support in the, the work that we've been doing. Do you have any more, Tim? That's it. Okay. Any other questions for Mr. Weedrick? 
Thank you, Tim. We appreciate it. We appreciate you. Tell your staff thank you as well. Certainly do that. Thank you. Next, um, Dirk Wilkie with some legislative updates. And um, Dirk, when you're finished with your legislative updates, would you mind uh, introducing Dr. Wavy? Uh, sure. Thank you, Chairman Poole and Council members. I believe that Clint Fleckenstein will be popping up a PowerPoint to walk us through the... There it goes. And so I know that my name's... A oh, geez. Well, now I'm seeing like 100 faces. I um, think I need some Led Zeppelin. <laughs> There's always one more yeah. button to press. Yeah, that was, was like an exciting concert. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, I know my name is attached to the legislative wrap up, but we actually had a very active session uh, for the Department of Health. And so um, just to make sure that you guys are getting the best information, we will be tagging in and out here. Um, so with that, Clint, can we move to the first slide? And so when I say that we had an active session, I mean that we did have an active session. Uh, we had 206 bills that the Department of Health tracked. Uh, normally we're in uh, the hundreds and so uh, it, it was a very active session for us. Um, our fiscal team obviously was very busy, 17 fiscal notes submitted. And then we directly testified on at least 28 bills. And so with that, um, the first tag in will be Brenda Weiss who will be walking through our budget. Um, thank you, Clint, and good morning, um, Health um, Chairman Poole and members of the Health Council. I always enjoy presenting in front of you, and I won't get in the weeds on any of this, I promise. Um, but I need to let you know this legislative session really left us in a good position fiscally. Um, the budget we had requested was added to by um, the governor's office. So you'll see we had a base budget of this biennium and then the executive budget um, did make an increase. That sharp increase is really related to COVID activity, um, 95 million. And then you'll see legislative action actually dropped that number um, by a significant amount, but that drop was related to how they were handling the COVID money fiscally in all agencies. And so I'll walk through that a bit and explain that to you um, so it makes some sense. So in looking at all of this in our salaries and wages line item, what I can say is that um, we are fully funded as an agency. We were able to accommodate some of the needs we needed in hard to fill positions, that being our forensic examiner, um, Dr. Weeby, our state health officer was a position that we were recruiting for a period of time. The funding in this budget accounts for that and also accounts for the legislative increases for the team members. And I'll cover that in a future slide. In our operating, we had looked internally and in order to meet budget guidelines, we did not reduce services in the operating area, but, but rather looked at how we could be more efficient with our travel, with how we operated. So that reduction in operating in the executive budget is really a result of it measures we took internally to offset costs. And then the increase you'll see that was added by um, a legislatively approved budget really is a result of a million dollars being added to the contract with UND for the forensic examiner services. A much needed increase, um, but something we were not able to do over the last few biennia because of funding and um, staying within our budget guidelines. In the capital assets area, we're real excited to say that we do have a couple projects that have been added, and those projects include a full body imaging system for the forensic examiner's office and also the addition of an electronic record system. Those were supported um, by the governor and also then carried through um, at the legislative level. Um, another thing that's exciting for us is that our bond payment for our lab building and our um, medical examiner or forensic examiner's lab morgue will actually end in December of 2022. So we will not have bond payments beyond next biennium. In the area of grants, we actually saw an increase in the executive budget and that was a result of some core funding increases we were receiving, were receiving in the budget, mainly in the immunization and disease control area. And then added to that during the legislative session, the legislature added back our fetal alcohol syndrome grant that's extended to UND. We had made that reduction in order to comply with budget guidelines. And then some of the work you did today, the very first thing on your agenda related to loan repayment, um, the legislature did add back the ability to provide slots each year of the upcoming biennium. The slots you approved today actually will get paid in the first year of next biennium. So we're grateful for that addition. 
in the tobacco prevention and control area, we did see a slight increase and that's related to funding that'll go out um, to local public health and to our other providers to help curb the tobacco use in the state. You'll see a slight increase that was supported by the legislature for our WIC food payments program. And these are just literally the food payments that go out, not the administration of the program. And those um, that increase is attributed to what we feel might be an impact COVID had on families. And we might see a slight increase in our caseload. So we built that within the budget request. And then finally, statewide health strategies that was recommended by the executive um, executive office and OMB, our governor. And that was based on the work done by Dr. Wynn, um, our public health strategist. The legislature did keep that money in the budget, but they added some caveats to that. And I'll cover that in, the, in a future slide. And then as I mentioned, COVID-19, as we made our base budget request, we did not include any items or any funding related to COVID based on the budget guidelines. The executive recommendation did include the 95 million I mentioned earlier. And then the legislature did not reduce the general fund portion of that or the other funds, which is coming from the Community Health Trust Fund. <clears throat> but instead, they removed the federal funds, 93 million, all said and done, into House Bill 1394. And I'll cover that in a future slide with you as well. And then finally for our FTE, we we're real pleased um, that we actually ended up with a net increase of 6.5 FTE to really help us forward the public health and prevention efforts in the state of North Dakota. COVID of course brought it front and center about the lack of funding for public health. And this will help us drive forward and do better things as a team as we move forward into the next biennium. We actually were provided 10.5 additional FTE spread throughout the agency. And then that number was offset by four individuals that will become part of IT unification. IT unification was an effort started by the executive branch last biennium. And our agency will then join that effort this biennium with the movement of four FTE, not physically, they'll still reside and be embedded in our agency but rather they will fall under supervision of North Dakota information technology. So Clint, if you could move it to the next slide, please. So when it comes to funding, as far as the amount of general, federal and special funds in our budget, just a reminder, our special funds are fees we collect in various regulatory and licensing programs and at the lab. And it also includes any private foundation grants we might receive. So when looking at what our base budget request was, you'll see the executive budget had a very sizable increase. That increase of just over $54 million was offset, about, offset by our budget guidelines, um, the reductions we had to make. But also when we were in front of the Senate, we were made aware of additional COVID funding that was passed by former President Trump um, in his administration in December of 2020. What that allowed us to do is actually take our $95 million budget for COVID and do a funding shift of $45 million away from the general fund and funding those activities with federal funds instead. So that ultimately the final increase in our general fund is approximately 9 million. And that increase is almost directly attributed to COVID. Part of those COVID costs will be ongoing um, considering the budgeting process and some will be one time. So what that means going into the future is that as we prepare the next budget in concert with the Department of Human Services as a new agency of the Department of Health and Human Services is that the money, the general fund that's tied to one-time expenditures it will go away, but the money that was given to us, which is about 4.2 million of general fund, will actually play into the equation of either a hold even budget or if there's budget reductions, the starting point will be increased by $4.2 million. Um, Clint, next slide, please. 
So there was some intent language that I thought you would find of interest in our Senate Bill 2004, which is actually our appropriation bill. With that, I told you I'd mention a little bit about what was added on to the statewide health strategies that were funded from the Community Health Trust Fund. And that is 1.5 of it will come from that fund, but it's contingent upon securing a dollar for dollar matching funds. And it's an all or nothing effort, which was clarified in the conference committee. So we need to find 1.5 million of foundation dollars or private other private grants, things that can help us match the 1.5 appropriated out of the Community Health Trust Fund. And then we are able to move forward uh, with our statewide health strategies. Then moving to the next bullet, um, we're talking about COVID and there was $4.5 million funded from the Community Health Trust Fund. That money is to go to local public health as they are our boots on the ground, helping us with our COVID-19 efforts. What the intent language said is that the department is to be looking for other federal funding sources available before we actually access that community health trust fund. Well, what has happened um, right towards the tail end of the legislative session is the American um, Rescue Plan Act was passed. And there is some money in that act, 1.8 million that will actually offset this $4.5 million need. There's also additional health equity federal grants that are coming to the department that will offset another 2 million. So our need from the Community Health Trust Fund will be reduced significantly just as they had intended. So we have that moving forward even before the biennium starts. So we're really excited about that. And then lastly, there was a legislative management study um, that they consider studying the roles of the state health officer, the health council, the medical advisory board, and the governor. And again, that's not a mandatory study, but rather um, they are to consider studying that. So next slide. Then in addition to our appropriation bill, Senate Bill 2004, there was appropriation included in three other bills, two of them very, very significant as far as funding. As I had mentioned earlier, House Bill 1394 is where they pooled all of the money um, that was related, federal money, excuse me, that was related to COVID-19. What they wanted to do as a legislative body is to have one place to look to see where all the COVID um, federal funding was by agency. So within that bill, 93 million is attributed to our upcoming um, biennium, the 21-23 biennium. That bill also included some funding that might have been necessary to close out the 1921 biennium. So if you were to look at that appropriation bill and look at this slide, the numbers will not agree, but I can tell you the 93 million is the amount that's planned to go forward. That bill also includes language that allows us to carry forward any other additional funding and appropriation in 1394 to carry that forward into 2123. So we may even carry over more than the 93 million. We will see how things go when we close out the biennium. Then House Bill 1395 was a bill that actually outlines how many CARES dollars or coronavirus relief funding each agency received in state government. So the Department of Health was included in that. And with all of the emergency commission action that occurred over the last um, year, we had more CARES money or CRF money than we needed to process expenditures. Um, the reason for the excess was related to additional federal grants that came to our agency and FEMA funding that actually then was extended through September of 2021. So FEMA will actually go into the future um, biennium. And then also on top of um, FEMA being extended, they eliminated the match requirement. And so right now FEMA is reimbursing any FEMA allowable cost at 100%. Previously, when it was initially passed during this federal emergency, the matching ratio was 75-25. And so because of some additional funding sources, we were able to turn back, if you will, $72 million of CARES money that actually was then given to other state agencies to fund their needs. And then on top of that, I had mentioned before the American Rescue Plan Act had passed um, to some that's known as ARPA. So with that money, 87.29 million is coming into the Department of Health from that act. And so they appropriated those funds in House Bill 1395. 
So altogether, we have a Senate Bill 2004, which is our appropriation for $180 million. And then the combination of these two, we have another $180. So $360 million, I, I said 180, it should be 180 million twice. Um, we will have a sufficient um, amount of money to get our work done into the next biennium. And then finally in House Bill 1012, there was funding included for us. House Bill 1012 is the appropriation bill for the Department of Human Services. It included a section that would grant to the Task Force on Prevention of Sexual Abuse of Children just over a half a million dollars with half of it coming from the general fund for us to provide a grant um, for them to carry out their activities. Next slide. And I won't go into this slide in great detail, but I just wanted to give you something that would allow you to take a look at how the spending is planned for that $93 million as we know it today. COVID has changed our funding patterns drastically um, based on level of caseload, based on hospitalizations, based on interest in testing. And so this is our proposal going forward by major category. And as things evolve and change, we will be able to change amongst the different categories because the COVID funding was provided in a special line item that allows us the flexibility to cover costs where they occur. And then next slide. This is the ARPA funding or the American Rescue Plan funding, the 87 million. And this just shows you in a big picture where that funding it came to the Department of um, Health from the federal government. Um, WIC did see a slight increase so we could provide fresh fruits and vegetables for our recipients and that'll occur June through September. And then ELC school-based testing, this was an effort from the epidemiology and lab capacity grant that allows us and the mission is for keeping schools open through testing. You'll see that's 22 million. Um, we did get a very sizable amount to deal with health equity, which is um, a fabulous grant, and we're really excited to be recipients of that for 31 million. And then finally, we did get two, two separate grant notices of, um, for immunization and to work towards vaccination efforts of just over 32 million. Next slide. So some highlights of our budget, and I've touched on some of them, were the capital projects, the funding for the forensic examiner's office for that record system and the full body imaging. When it comes to our grants, we're real excited that we maintain the rural emergency assistant grants at a hold even amount. Local public health state aid was held even. We did see a slight decrease in the grants to local public health for tobacco, um, just a a quarter million dollars is the decrease. But we're also relooking at that program and our program manager, Neil Charvet, for that program is actually looking at some services that can actually be handled at the statewide level rather than having those extended expenditures occur at the local public health level. And then also, as I mentioned before, provided an increase in funding for our forensic examiner services. Um, the million dollars added by the house and then the 85,000 that was supported by um, the executive recommendation. COVID being a big area and a big effort in front of us for the next two years, this breaks down the funding. Um, some of that funding, the 9.2 and the 4.5 is included in Senate Bill 2004. And the federal funding is included between those two bills I just covered with you, House Bill 1394 and 1395. I already visited with you about our um, excitement over the added FTEs, the 10.5, to expand our core public health team and then the shift of the four to NDIT. And then also, this may not be something that was um, highlighted throughout the session, but we will discontinue providing shared services for DEQ as, they, um, as we move to a full separation. Um, OMB started taking over the payroll and the HR functions for DEQ in July with the vast amount of temporary and um, positions we had added to deal with COVID. And now the accounting functions will shift to DEQ as they set up their own accounting division. So we're pretty heavily involved in making that happen um, from the close of the session until June 30th and getting all those tasks transferred. And then next slide. As far as um, our team and the impacts to the team, what was passed by the legislature is a 1.5 increase the first year of the biennium with everybody receiving a $100 minimum and then an average pay increase of 2% in year two. Um, we are happy to know that we will be continuing 
to receive um, as a team and team members of North Dakota the health insurance benefits without contributing to that. And actually, the increase in the monthly premiums was only $2 per month um, at 1429 And then the other benefits are outlined under that category where House Bill 1209 allows for the study of closing the defined benefit retirement plan. And um, that did see it as um, it was presented initially as some actual bills to make changes, and it landed as a study. So we um, will look forward to seeing the results of that and see what the outcome of that would be. And then as far as policy changes, there's been a slight change where it gives um, House Bill 1058 gives human resources management the authority to actually administer the state's leave sharing program. And that concludes my presentation before we move on to the different sections and, and take a look at the specific legislation for those areas. But before we move forward, I just want to um, check to see if there's any questions. Okay, Clint, you can advance it and thank you. So I'll tag back in here. Uh, thank you, Brenda. Uh, Clint, next slide, please. And so there was multiple agency uh, wide bills that impacted the agency as a whole. Um, the first one that I wanted to bring to your attention was uh, House Bill 1118, and this was related to governor's authority for executive orders. So the bill would allow legislative leaders to request that a governor call lawmakers back to Bismarck for a special session. If the governor did not call the special session within a week, uh, the emergency order would automatically end within 30 days after the lawmaker sent the request. And so really there was, we talked about this at our last state health council, there was three different uh, bills that they were kind of along these lines. Um, as I said in, in that meeting, 1118 was from our perspective, the best of, of all those bills. It did have, um, it was a better compromise. And from a state health officer uh, perspective, uh, it didn't impact the state health officer's authority as much as the other bills would have. Um, so the changes that it did impact was, is if you're not in a state of emergency, so think of us right now, a state health officer could no longer do a statewide emergency de declaration or health order. Uh, we'd have to do it by a geographical basis. And uh, as we talked about last time, almost all health emergencies are local, so that, that doesn't have a significant impact. Um, if it was a state of emergency, we still could do statewide orders. And so that was the nice uh, flexibility that was allowed in this bill. So we were excited that of the three bills that passed or that were in front of the legislature this session, that this was the one that passed. Um, the next bill that I wanted to talk about was 1323. And so this is relating to limitations on mask wearing. Uh, 1323, uh, went through a, a couple of alterations, but where it landed was it, it was that it prohibits statewide elected officials and the state health officer from doing masking orders or masking mandates. Um, so we do have, we were a bit disappointed that this is the direction that it ended up. It did pass the House and the Senate and was vetoed by the governor, but it then got overrided, overrid um, after the veto to move forward. Um, as the person that I guess signed the masking order um, during the COVID pandemic, we thought we really had used this tool um, pretty strategically. We had the shortest masking order in the nation at, at 62 days. Uh, we really did try to emphasize masking on a local level first. And then what we had heard throughout the course of that process was they really wanted a uniformed um, masking order done by the state. And so this, this kind of takes that tool out of our hands. So that, that is a little bit disappointing for future pandemics, um, but at least the tool is still available at the local level. Uh, Clint, next slide. Another big agency bill is 1247. And so this is the bill that merges the Department of Health with the Department of Human Services. And so we are still knee deep in diving into what this bill does in terms of process and, and improvement. Uh, this doesn't take effect until September of 2022. And so I will say that we've already activated um, a team 
an integration team, which involves Dr. Weeby, myself, Brenda, um, representatives from DHS and the governor's office to start uh, working through this process. Um, we are excited about potentially providing a more efficient path to programs and services. So we'd have one efficient path um, to services for the citizens. Uh, but we're really in the beginning stages of analyzing um, all the changes and in intentions in this bill and, and just trying to figure out the best outcome. Um, I will say that this bill did have impact to the State Health Council. And so one of the things the bill does do is that um, effective September 2022, the State Health Council would no longer um, be reviewing or, or authorizing the administrative rules process. And so that would no longer be happening. Uh, we still are pretty much diving into um, if anything else was affected by um, that bill in terms of State Health Council role. Um, I know that Kirsten, uh, or Kristen, you had, um, you were involved in this. I'm not sure if you have anything else to add in terms of state health council role or, or, or duties that was presented. You know, <clears throat> there was a lot of questions, a lot of comments about it, but I don't know that this really got deep into that. I think part of it was this, the health council has moved away from being a purely governing board and is now much more of an advisory and, and kind of just, it's changing its role. And I think that this updated the law closer to how we're functioning today. So I don't think we'll see a huge change. Yeah, and so um, that's good clarification. Thank you. So if there's any questions on this, I know this is a, a very significant uh, bill, um, especially the impact for both the health and Department of Health and the Health Council. Um, I'm willing to answer any questions I can, but like I said, we are still in the very beginning processes of kind of navigating uh, where we go and what we do, uh, but be willing to answer any questions on this um, either now or, or after we walk through all these bills. Well, I think, Dirk, it will be interesting to get that clarification down the road because, as you know, through this COVID pandemic, et cetera, there were folks that reached out to the Health Council assuming we had certain authorities. So clarification of all this in the in the future, I think, will be a good thing. Yeah, I, I, I would agree. Um, I think that was also part of the intention of that potential study that was in Senate Bill 2004 that evaluated the health council, the governor, um, the uh, state health officer's roles. And so uh, I know that it's, it's, it's very much in front of the legislator's um, line of sight. And so um, as we evaluate and move forward, we'll continue to bring any updates that, that we kind of learn or, or any clarity that we learn um, in front of the health council at future meetings. I, I will add this, this is Dwayne. One of the issues that I, continually have with the organization of state and even federal agencies is where the advocacy effort for an industry along with the regulatory oversight of an industry tend to be housed in the same authority. That always kind of bothers me. I always feel like there should be some separation. That's one of the things that, that had bothered me all along about the idea of, of melding these two agencies together. But that's not my decision. <laughs> it's already made. And I know that's something that we're gonna to have to navigate as we kind of move through the integration process. And so um, I know that we are the regulatory body of long-term care, for example, and they may be the funders. And so um, that is something that we're gonna to have to have just clear delineation and make sure that we're not um, crossing any unintended consequences of uh, conflicts or interests or anything of that, but that's, that's in our line of sight. So I know that that's part of the things we'll be evaluating. And, and, and just to be honest, um, as a nation, there's plenty of departments of health and human services across the nation currently that operate and and, and, and it works good and works well. I, I, and so from our perspective, the decision's been made. And so we're gonna, we're gonna move forward and we're gonna try to be the best of, of those departments of health and human services and, and have a very good positive outcome for our team members and to the citizens that we serve. Yeah, and from my end, I, I have no doubt that you as a staff will try and do the best that you can, no matter what circumstances you're put into. And like you said, it's a decision that's made, and it doesn't matter. It's not really in our authority anyway. What matters is always looking forward and doing the best you can, and I know that you and your staff will do that, Dirk. Thank you. Um, so if there's any additional questions on 1247... 
then I'll move on to 1031. Uh, so this is a bill that's related to um, state agency fees. So an agency that has 40 fees or fewer, which is the Department of Health, uh, need to report to OMB information relating to the fee amount. And so it's just a bill related to the reporting. Uh, 1418 is related to qualifications of the state health officer. And so this bill did change that it was a requirement now uh, for the state health officer to be a physician with public health experience. We're very blessed that that includes Dr. Weedy. Um, so we're excited about that. And honestly, I think it's a good change for the state. Um, selfishly, I get to be the la I got to be the last uh, non-state health officer that was a physician. So I feel that good for me. Um, so uh, in the long term, it, it's a good position because you want to have that medical um, experience and understanding of the decisions you're going to be making. And um, I think it actually adds a bit of credibility to the position. So I think it was a solid decision uh, across the board. Uh, next slide, Clint. Uh, some bills that did not pass that would have uh, impacted the agency-wide. Uh, there was a bill related to annual legislative sessions. Uh, that bill did not pass. Uh, that bill does come up every session, so I would expect it to come up in a future session as well. Um, there was the bill 2046, which related to the state retirement plan or, or PERS. This bill would have closed the main defined benefit retirement plan on July 1 of 2023. And then so future um, employees would have had a defined contribution plan. And so as Brenda discussed, uh, there will be a study to, to look at this. This is a very, very significant change in terms of just recruitment and, and potentially retention of, of staff, but it's also a very costly endeavor. Um, so it's good to see that that's being studied first. Um, Senate Bill 2331, this would have made the state health officer an elected position. Uh, this bill, uh, this is the first time I've seen this, but it, it was an interesting concept and uh, it, it didn't go very far in, in the process. Um, and then agency-wide, the 1385 AG Review of Administrative Rules. So this bill actually came about because of cottage, uh, our cottage food bill. And so this would re require the AG to review rules for legality and legislative intent. They already do review it for legality, but the question was in regards to legislative intent. Um, so the conflict that happened was, as you are aware, is the, the previous biennium um, cottage foods was, uh, was did not pass and it did not pass for a whole host of reasons. Well, the biennium before that, it did pass with the idea that we would do uh, administrative rules to clarify. And so there was a conflict there of, of the bill passing after uh, the bill had initially passed with legislative intent, and then the bill fails next biennium that has conflicting legislative intent. It would have asked the AG's office to kind of look at both of those situations and determine which is the more um, applicable legislative intent. Um, that becomes problematic because bills fail for a whole host of reasons. Um, sometimes it's financial, sometimes it's political, sometimes it's just duplicate bills that are, and so then there's there's potential conflict. And so, um, although it didn't pass this session, uh, there was a lot of push for this, so we could see it returning in, in a future form, in a future session. Um, Clint, next slide. And with that, I will uh, pass it on to Kirby to talk about bills that impacted disease control and forensic pathology. Kirby. Thank you. Um, and uh, Chairman Poole and Health Council members, thank you. And, and so we can just move forward, Clint, and uh, to the first slide. Um, so bills that passed that impacted disease control are divisions within disease control. Um, the first one is 1163. Uh, this was relating to the needle exchange programs that are in place in North Dakota. And basically uh, they added um, uh, supplies into and defined supplies into the bill and, and into uh, Century Code um, and then uh, allowed for the um, uh, those supplies to be part of the program and then to allow for possession of those supplies by the program without uh, having to be concerned about criminal um, uh, uh, 
criminal activity and, and police enforcement on that. And so I think that was a good bill. And, and we, we, we did track that one. We didn't testify on that one, uh, but, but we felt that, that it was, that was a, a good move for uh, that particular program. Um, 1175, House Bill 1175 affected most of disease control uh, and its limits on the liability for businesses regarding employees and customers and civil litigation. And this was really regarding COVID. Uh, although it doesn't impact us directly, we did track this just to, to, to make sure that uh, um, there wasn't going to be uh, amendments that would affect us. Uh, basically, it does provide for limits on, on uh, that for businesses and, and uh, health providers uh, on liabilities uh, related to COVID. Um, if I remember correctly, 1175 was fairly detailed, uh, talked a lot about health care facilities um, and uh, talked about supplies and equipment and, and, uh, and other things related to COVID prevention. Um, so it, I think it was a, a fairly well thought out bill that that actually ended up passing there. So 1219 relating to reportable conditions in postmortem communicable diseases. Uh, this will require in the, if a, the governor de does declare a state of emergency or there is a state of emergency related to an infectious disease would require the state health officer or the health council to, de to decide whether that disease should become notifiable uh, in terms of postmortem notifications. And uh, like I said, it, it does only uh, apply when there is an emergency. And uh, basically the health officer or the health council, you, we would have to bring you together and, and, and uh, uh, we'd have to make a decision whether that particular infectious disease uh, needs to be uh, something that uh, um, once an individual passes away and, and they are infected with that, that we have to provide that post-mortem notification uh, process. So, um, 1492 uh, was uh, a bill that related to limitations on pharmacy benefit managers, but actually uh, it was uh, uh, there was a clause in there talking about pharmacists and COVID testing. And so uh, pharmacists can administer COVID-19 testing uh, as a result of uh, that language. And so 1492 did pass. Uh, that was again, when we that we just tracked. Um, and then the division of immunization, there were a lot of immunization related uh, um, uh, legislation this, this past session. Uh, 1465 uh, was relating to vaccine information. 1465, uh, if I'm remembering correctly, was a hog house bill. Uh, it, the bill didn't start out to do anything, to be anything related to vaccine inf infection or information, uh, but uh, uh, the amendments that went through basically um, uh, would, would provide limits on, on uh, the sharing and requiring uh, an individual's vaccination status or the presence or path of pathogens, antigens or antibodies or an individual's post-transmission recovery status um, for infectious diseases. Um, and this bill would, uh, only apply to vaccines that are authorized under uh, FDA authorized under emergency use authorizations. So it's not applicable to a vaccine and vaccine records for vac FDA approved vaccines. Um, it doesn't apply to the parts of the century code that deal with uh, the North Dakota information information immunization information system uh, are to school vaccinations uh, and it doesn't apply to higher education and those uh, in those institutions under the board of higher education. So there are some limitations on on it. Um, it all in all, uh, the bill probably could have been a lot worse in terms of uh, limiting uh, the sharing of vaccinations. And so uh, from our perspective, um, you know, I think we can work within the, uh, within the, the bill and, and obviously it's law now and it will, or it will become law and, and we will work within that. So uh, next slide. Okay, bills that did not pass that we worked on. Um, House Bill 1204, uh, mask limitations. Um, this was uh, basically, if I remember correctly, 1204 was more towards uh, 
um, businesses and, and employers and employees uh, and allowing employees to opt out of masking if, if a business was requiring masking. Um, it, it, uh, it did fail. Uh, as Dirk mentioned, House Bill 1323 did pass, uh, which uh, was a little bit different uh, uh, in that it, 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 the governor and the health officer can't require masking uh, at a statewide level. But, uh, but I do expect that this could p potentially resurface again some way or another. Um, and I'm not sure what, what the atmosphere will be like two years from now, but uh, you know, I, I think that the, the, any, from my perspective, I think that um, the legislature is always interested in, in knowing how much, you know, how much liberties are, are, are being uh, lim limited by different activities out there. And so I think that's something that may come up again. We did not testify on 1204. We were just tracking that one. Um, House Bill 1244 deals with raw milk and expanded the sales of raw milk uh, to the premises and to local stores close to the premise. Um, and this has been a recurring um, theme in the last several legislative sessions. Um, I think that uh, you know there's there's a contingency out there that they 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 uh, believe that raw milk is good and and uh, is better for you than uh, pasteurized milk. Uh, from our perspective, you know raw milk uh, carries all the concerns of of infectious diseases that we're concerned about. You know pasteurization was first developed to prevent TB and 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 to help uh, prevent TB. Uh, which isn't so much the problem today, but other pathogens, Salmonella, E. coli, Campylobacter, uh, you know, those are all things that, that are still of, of, are very concerning. And so um, we, we did not testify on 1244, uh, but uh, uh, there were a lot of, lots of good, there was some good testimony. I watched that. There was some good testimony that came out of the private sector on that. And I, I thought that was really good, so. Um, 1259 wastewater testing. Uh, this particular bill would would have required a local public hearing before their local wastewater could be tested. Uh, uh, and um, I think that there's a potential that this will come back in, in the next session or, or in the future. Um, you know, there were two bills related to wastewater testing. Both of them failed, uh, but this one would have required a, a local public hearing. Um, House Bill 1301, immunity of liability for communicable diseases and prohibiting vaccines. Uh, 1301, we did track uh, that that bill um, would have prohibited requiring vaccination status or requesting vac vaccination records before uh, services could be provided, to, uh, our people could access services. It provided protection against civil liabilities uh, and uh, would have prohibited requiring vaccinations uh, and other immunizations in order. Um, and I think that this is again, an, another um, area that we're gonna see more legislation in the future on, uh, more bills being introduced. Uh, there's, there's a, I think a, a, a growing and a better organized um, uh, contingency of our population uh, that either they're they're not in favor of vaccinations or they're they're not in favor of the government are um, individuals enforcing are forcing people to be vaccinated and uh, are requiring people to be vaccinated and I think that this is not this is something that we're going to continue to be uh, having to to work uh, against and, and try to promote uh, vaccinations as a, a safe, an effective tool for preventing infectious diseases. So um, next slide. Thanks, Clint. Um, 1307, prohibit public accommodation based on vaccination. Uh, this bill would not allow entities to use vaccination status to determine what services they could provide an individual. The bill would have impacts on vaccine policies used by healthcare and other industries. Uh, passage of the bill could have impacted the ability of an entity to keep employees, customers, and clients safe. Uh, that bill, 1307, uh, we did track that one as well. We didn't testify on this one, and that, that failed. Um, 1320 limits vaccine requirements. This one, uh, House Bill 1320, 
actually did uh, uh, limit, um, uh, I'm gonna find Molly's notes on this because she testified on this, uh, removing immunization requirements for schools and childcare. It actually repealed 230717, which was the school and childhood uh, vaccination requirements. Uh, we did testify against this bill, Molly testified. Uh, and again, I think there's a growing uh, organization uh, in North Dakota and, and they're, they're well organized uh, that uh, either they're against vaccination or they're against the, the uh, states or, or any entity um, requiring vaccinations. And so I think we're gonna see more of that. Um, 1328 vitamin D, I, we just were watching that. Um, and uh, uh, that was just requiring PERS to prepare legislation for the 68th session to extend coverage for vitamin D testing and report on the effects of testing and screening. So, um, uh, you know, really no direct impact on us. We were just watching that because there are, you know, I think that there's, there's a growing body of evidence that vitamin D is, is uh, maybe effective in helping to, to boost the immune system. And uh, we weren't sure what path this was gonna go down and, and it didn't go down that path. It was just really uh, uh, related to PERS. So um, 1348, uh, this was the bill that would have prohibited any wastewater testing. Uh, DEQ did uh, testify on this one. Um, basically DEQ, they're, they're responsible for making sure that wastewater uh, and that the testing that they do is, is making sure that that wastewater is ready to be discharged back into the environment. Um, and so it would have impacted their ability to, to maybe do that part of the public health that they do, um, making sure our environments are, are safe. Uh, but it would also would have prohibited us from doing any uh, testing uh, for infectious diseases that, for example, the COVID testing that, that is happening with wastewater testing, so. Okay, next. And I do expect, again, like I said, I do expect that that, that, that issue is probably not um, uh, dead neither right now. So uh, 1352, um, this was a bill that basically said that uh, their medical products could not be required uh, if the manufacturer of that medical product did not accept liability for injury or death as a result of the product. Um, this would have included immunization. So this basically would have said that unless the manufacturer of the vaccine uh, stepped up and uh, uh, accepted liability for deaths and injury, um, that vaccine could not be required. So it would have eliminated uh, our vaccination requirements for child care schools, uh, K through 12, and even probably uh, university system too. Um, and that, you know, we, we did testify against this one and uh, Molly testified. And basically there's a, a very good federal compensation program uh, that's available for vaccines. Uh, and uh, so there is a, a program, there's a program to look at uh, vaccine safety and to evaluate injuries uh, related to vaccines in, at the federal level, uh, the VARES program, the Vaccine Adverse Events Reporting Program. So there are systems in place for the vaccines to do this. And so I think that uh, from our perspective, we had concerns about this bill and in, in what it would have meant for uh, um, our vaccination rates and protecting our, our children and our, our North Dakota citizens from vaccine preventable diseases. Um, 1376, immunity from liability for employers regarding COVID-19. Uh, this was another uh, bill to to help limit uh, um, or protect uh, uh, businesses or employers from uh, civil litigation. Um, this one did not pass. Uh, 1377 immunization exemptions. Uh, this bill would have put extensive criteria above what the FDA requires before the vaccine could be required for child care, school or employment. Uh, uh, this is just one of several attempts uh, uh, to prohibit uh, are to prohibit vaccination requirements and uh, uh, try to limit um, the role of, of um, vaccinations in, in public health. Um, 1377, uh, we did testify against, uh, Molly testified against that one. So um, 1468 was uh, also related to vaccines. Uh, this one we were tracking. 
Uh, this bill required extensive counseling by medical providers, including reviewing the vaccine package insert with their patients before administering the vaccine. Uh, this bill would have really been uh, uh, intrusive, I think, from our perspective, intrusive for medical providers, dictating what how they practice their uh, with their patients um, and requiring a really quite extensive uh, uh, counseling. Um, Excuse me, 1468, uh, I'm, I got to look here to make sure we didn't testify on that one. No, we did just track that one. Uh, but, um, you know, there is extensive education that already is required uh, before a vaccine can be administered, including providing that information to um, patients before the vaccine is administered on, on adverse events and uh, the benefits and the risk of the vaccine, basically. And so uh, those requirements are already in place and they are fairly extensive. And so um, we, were, uh, we, we were relieved to see this one fail, to be honest with you. 1469, um, that was a bill that would have required parents or legal guardians to receive some education before they could exempt their children from a vaccination. Uh, so if a parent or a guardian elected to um, to not vaccinate a child, then uh, there would be uh, some uh, an educational program that they would have to go through to before they could complete that exemption process. And so that failed as well. We just monitored that one or tracked that one. So um, 2274 was a bill to expand uh, the scope of practice for naturopaths. Uh, we just we were tracking this one. Um, just to watch to see uh, what would happen with it. Um, but it did fail. Uh, it passed the first house uh, in the Senate and then it failed over on the, the House side. So 1465, um, vaccine health information sharing. It disallows mandating sharing vaccination status on limited situations. I think I, this is a repeat. I might have this in here twice. I think I covered that earlier, but it basically is the bill that prohibits state or local jurisdictions from requiring vaccination status disclosures or documentation for vaccines administered under FDA emergency use. This is the bill that would exempt um, the, the K through 12 requirements and it exempted um, the university system, as well as the the North Dakota immunization information system. So, um, and then 1386 limitations on business operations and capacities. Julie Wagendorf did testify uh, on this one uh, and against it. Uh, there were concerns uh, from that this bill would uh, impact her ability to regulate uh, restaurants um, and uh, the other uh, facilities that she regulates in food and lodging. Um, it, uh, we also had concerns about whether we would, if this bill would have passed, if we would have had the authority to shut down uh, a restaurant, for example, uh, if there was a foodborne outbreak that was ongoing and uh, we needed to, and, and we had good information to suggest the source of that outbreak was coming out of a particular establishment. Um, so we, we had concerns about this uh, and the bill did fail. So I'm certainly open for questions. So Kirby, this is uh, Gerald. And I don't know if you could answer this question, but there are still some uh, testing requirements for travel to Hawaii being a specific one that you can't travel there um, without quarantining unless you have testing from a, a quote-unquote approved lab employee. I'm just curious why the, the state um, lab with the PCR testing wouldn't be on these lists that are we, uh, that's a good question, Daryl, and, and I don't have a good answer for you. Uh, we've been trying to figure out how we can get our PCR testing um, approved. Uh, we're not exactly sure why, and it seems to be Hawaii that uh, uh, is, has been the, the state that uh, has come up the most often in conversation. And it seems to be that they have selected the laboratories that they will accept uh, um, test results from, and, and we're not exactly sure. There are very few public health laboratories that uh, meet 
Hawaii's requirements. So we're not exactly sure why. Well, well Kirby, one of the reasons why is because you have to apply to be a Hawaii friendly lab and there's a fee that's associated with doing that. And so uh, paying Hawaii to be known as the Hawaii friendly lab, um, that was, that was uh, an area that we were willing to do. Ah, oh, that's interesting. I didn't realize that they were, it was a sort of a, if you pay to apply, okay, all right. All right. Thanks, Dirk. So Kirby, this is Dwayne. I, I will say, um, I know that you were only tracking some of these and you, you didn't give testimony on some of these, but I know um, there were a lot of people that were interested in building forward, especially those that, that really hamper the focus on public health and the good of public health um, and also um, forget about the historic nature of various risks and how as a society over the last hundred years or so we've addressed public health risks um, I see I see a lot of the bills that did not pass as things that would have that could potentially walk us backwards um, and and so um, I'm, I'm really glad you followed and I'm, I'm glad you gave us this perspective yeah um yeah you know it, it's easy to lose track of of what uh public health has done in the last century uh, and you know when you look at uh safe drinking water uh um, sanitary sewage systems and you look at vaccinations and you look at the, the campaign to reduce tobacco uh boy you look at those those programs and how successful they have been in increasing the, the, the life expectancy and the quality of life for people. It's, it's, it's pretty amazing. So. Yeah, I go back to polio, smallpox, all of it. And, and you kind of put it all together and say, you know, it was so severe and we saw it as, as at our age, we saw the tail end of a lot of that. So we saw the after effects of, of how bad those things could be. So I think there's an appreciation, especially in, in, in our generation still for that. And I'm, I'm wondering if maybe we're not losing some of that in some of the younger generations and understanding what a real public health crisis can be. You know, I think that's, that's Chairman Cool. I think that's been, that's one of the challenges for public health in general. When things are going well, people take it for granted. Uh, you know, unlike medicine, who people are going, uh, you know, more and more, I think that's good that they're going in for preventive medicine. You know, there, there's well, there, there, there's the, the well checks, you know, but, uh, but generally speaking, medicine's there to fix people's acute problems. And uh, uh, if they get a fix, that's great. And, uh, you know, and that's good news. But when public health is working good, people, it's easy to take it for granted, so. Well, thank you to you and your staff and, and, and all that you've done in this. And uh, I know that you are one of those leaders that is incredibly humble and, and passes credit on to his staff in, a, in an incredible manner. And I think they appreciate that, but I think um, we appreciate you very, very much as well. Thank you. Well, I certainly appreciate that, and I appreciate the, the guidance that I've gotten from so many of you uh, over the last couple of years, especially this last year. Um, so, appreciate it. Jim, Healthy and Safe Communities. All right. Good morning, everyone. Just doing a sound check. Can you hear me okay? Yep, we can hear you. Okay, sounds good. Good morning, um, Chairman Poole and members of the State Health Council. I'm honored to be here today to talk about the bills that impacted healthy and safe community section. You see the slide before you shows a woman that um, is on a mountaintop, she's been hiking. And I just wanna take a moment to um, reiterate how important physical activity is, especially I think even more so when people are working from home, there's a lot of sitting. And so we've been sitting for almost two hours now in this meeting. I know. I 
I just stood up a little bit ago. And I would encourage all of you to maybe take a stand up at where you're at um, during my presentation. If you need a little bit of a stretch break, um, it's just, it's sometimes hard. We, we have a lot of programs in our section that deal with physical activity and nutrition. So just wanted to, to mention that. Um, then we can go on to the next slide, please, Clint. Okay, so the first bill that we want to talk about that passed was House Bill 1112. That was DHS's appropriation bill. Brenda already talked about this. Um, and so basically what this does, it provides an appropriation to us, the health department, to provide a grant to the task force for the prevention of sexual abuse on children for staff and programming materials. So just this week, um, Mallory Sattler, who is um, with the domestic violence um, program. Um, she's going to be taking the lead with this. Her and the division director, Deanna, ask you, we're going to meet with Brenda this week and we are going to make a game plan so we can start moving forward on that very quickly. Um, the next one is um, the next several bills have to do with special health services and I will provide an overview, but I do want you to know that Kim Ruby is with us today as well. So when I'm done with our sections presentation, if you have any questions specifically, Kim is really just an expert on this and I know that she would be able to answer questions. So just wanted to let you know that. So the next one again is 1012. That is of course DHS's um, appropriation bill. The reason why Kimberly and her team watch this so closely is because the DHS budget bill really does impact special health services. Um, because special health services utilizes their MMIS um, system to pay providers, um, they also utilize the Medicaid rate for payment. And so if the provider increases or implement, that impacts both Medicaid and special health services since they're a payer. And so Kimberly did let me know that they she does believe there's going to be about a 2% increase for provider payment um, in both years of the budget. She, 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 Kimberly is great at what she does. She's been at this for a really long time and she did budget that 2% increase in there. So she had the foresight to do that in her budget. In addition, special health services, you know, provides financial gap filling for up to age 21. So through that Medicaid expansion, if that's no longer available to that age group, um, special health services might be covering more of the young adults in that population, um, 18 to 21, because special health services covers up until age 21. And Kimberly had mentioned that the contract they have with Sanford for that Medicaid expansion will expire. Um, it'll go through just the end of the year. And so after January 1st, then, um, that special health services may be providing more coverage to that population. Another bill that passed is 1288. That's relating to Medicaid coverage of continuous glucose monitoring devices. Um, we are very happy to see this bill passed and just need to give a lot of kudos to the special health services team and to Dr. Connell, who's one of our field medical officers and also the medical director for special health services. Um, they worked really um, long and hard with um, Medicaid um, to, um, to look at this and to um, and work on this bill. So basically what this means is that special Special health services will no longer need to provide the financial gap filling for paying for um, those glucose, continuous glucose monitors for those medical Medicaid eligible children as Medicaid will then cover that service. And so that really has been a quite a major expense for special health services this past year. So that will free up some funding there to be utilized in other areas. So next slide, please, Clint. The next one is a House Concurrent Resolution 3011. This is to consider studying and researching the impact of substance abuse and a neonatal withdrawal syndrome, including a focus on fetal alcohol syndrome um, disorders, including treatment services available, potential, pre potential prevention, and whether existing policies for children and adults are appropriate. Um, the reason why we're really see, watching to see if this study is picked is currently special health services administers those pass-through funds for the University of North Dakota for their fetal alcohol syndrome center. Um, and so if that study goes through, um, we may be involved in that. And Brenda talked about that at the very beginning, how that money was put back into our budget. Um, my understanding is that um, on, I think it's this month on the 19th, Legislative Council will be looking at those bills. I understand there's, I think, 12 required studies and 72 um, consideration of studies. And so then um, I guess after probably late next week, we'll be we'll know if this is going to be picked as a study. 
Um, another one related to special health services is 1224, and that's related to medical assistance coverage of metabolic supplements. Once again, something that Kimberly and her team and Dr. Connell worked with. And so sometimes Medicaid eligible babies born with certain conditions are often identified through the newborn screening. Um, special health services will no longer need to pay for those necessary metabolic supplements that are considered non-cover services by North Dakota Medicaid. So that would be a not, that, that this would now be a covered service. So those were two, um, this one, and then the continuous glucose monitoring were two big wins, um, not just for special health services, but honestly for um, the children and the families that we serve. Another bill that passed was um, House Bill 1105 related to breastfeeding. And so it, it's, we this bill has been on the books and so um we're thrilled that that you know there is a law that allows women to breastfeeding what we wanted to point out here is that there was um language that was removed from the bill the bill um used to state state that a woman could breastfeed if she acted in a discreet and modest manner and so that language has now been removed um and so it like i said it really doesn't impact our breastfeeding program but it was good to have that language removed moved because, um, you know, women do act in a modest and discreet manner. And so it was just, it was good. It was good cleanup language for that bill. Next slide, please, Clint. More bills that passed. Um, this is related to our Title V Maternal and Child Health Program. Um, it's, re it's House Bill 1205 relating to establishing the Maternal Mortality Review Committee. Um, we were very happy to see this, see this bill passed and have been working on this, honestly, for, for quite some time. At the federal level, maternal mortality review committees have been a priority. Um, and because it's it's something that, um, you know, that we, we want to be sure that we're working with that population to be sure that best outcomes for those moms are possible because we know when we have good outcomes for moms, we have good outcomes for babies. So this bill actually requires UND School of Medicine and Health Sciences to establish a formal MMRC. And so, um, Mater like I said, maternal mortality is important data that we need to determine MCH priority strategies and activities. Per the bill, the Department of Health shall provide a certified copy of complete death records to the committee upon request. And in addition, the MCH staff up here at the state will be part of that review committee. It should be noticed that noted that North Dakota has had an MMRC for many years. In fact, probably one of the longest in the country it dates back um, to the 1960s. However, that review committee has not been formalized and the members have been really just OBGYNs. And um, so what this is gonna do is it's gonna formalize it. Um, it's gonna expand membership and it will require a report to be written where there can really be some good data sharing and actionable items. So we're excited to be working with UND to get that established. Next is 2189. This is to provide a legislative study um, of reduced harm nicotine um, products. So um, the bill was re originally related to the imposition of a tax on ENDS, which is electronic smoking devices, um, but it ended up as a study. And so we will um, see where that goes once they pick the studies. The next one is 2187. This is related to the regulation and licensure of nutritionists and dietitians. The reason why the WIC program was watching this is because, of course, the WIC program is not only at the state level, but at the local level, um, they employ many nutritionists. And what this did was it the use of the title nutritionist now is protected under the law and can only be used for those who are licensed nutritionist. And so basically, since WIC uses nutritionist title for their job descriptions, um, it will be up to local agency directors to determine the credentials of their agency staff. If they don't have staff that are actually, you know, a nutritionist by um, education, they may have to change the title of that job description from nutritionist to WIC nutrition educator. All of the nutritionists that we have at the state level that work in our WIC program are nutritionists. They are all, um, they all have that schooling and that education and that, that will not impact the title that we have to use for our WIC program at all. 
The next one is Senate Bill 2125. This one's related to the Healthcare Professional Student Loan Repayment Program. This one amended the Century Code related to the Healthcare Professional Student Loan Repayment Program. So a licensed behavioral analyst was included now in the Behavioral Health Care Professional Discipline list. Um, so they're now going to be eligible. And so we know that behavioral health is such a need. And so while this is a good thing because behavioral analysts are absolutely needed, it could increase the competition a little bit for the awards in that pool. So, next slide, please, Clint. All right, the next one is related to local public health, and this was Senate Bill 2303, and this was relating to tribal health units. Um, this would have permitted tribes to form tribal and local public health units. It did not pass. Local public health was opposed to it, um, more because there was going to be competing funding, um, perhaps with some of them a, pot a potential for duplication of services, especially in the Rolette County area, and then it could um, it could have been had decreased state aid funding to some of the current local public health units as well. Um, Turtle Mountain's continuing to explore how to become a state recognized local public health unit and their efforts may result in some future potential legislation. Kelly Nagel, who's our local public health liaison is also on the call with us today. And so if there's any other questions related to this, um, Kelly would be able to answer that at the end here. Um, and that, I'm sorry, that did not pass. I should have qualified that at the, the, the start. Um, the another bill that did not pass, um, quite honestly, that, that um, gosh, our tobacco program worked with Tobacco Free North Dakota um, very intently um, was related to cigar bars and lounges. And um, that, um, that would have um, just been a bill that would have taken us back since we are tobacco free state. And that would have allowed establishments if they um, had 30% of their revenue to um, be considered if 30% of their revenue um, selling cigars, um, they could then consider themselves a cigar bar or a lounge and then people could have come in and smoked cigars in uh, establishment. And there was, um, there were some provisions with it, but there was no um, there was really no accountability. And so if somebody said, yep, 30% of our revenue is from this, there was no um, there was no accountability, like nobody was gonna be going in and checking that. So anyway, could talk about that one for a long time, but um, we are happy to see that that one didn't pass, but might see that recycled again for next session in another way. Another one that didn't pass was related to an increase on the tax of, of um, cigarettes. I think we all know that, um, you know, additional revenue generated could have could be beneficial to the tobacco program and efforts and i know you guys all know that a tobacco tax is evidence-based strategy to reduce youth and adult tobacco use. So um, it didn't pass, but it could have been beneficial if it did. And you know we we do see these bills so we might see this one again next time. Next slide again Clint more bills that didn't pass this is another one 1422 once again related to a tax imposed on cigarettes and tobacco products same rationale as the last one um, 2188 relating to the authority of a political subdivision to regulate the sale of consumer merchandise this would have taken away the authority for local community just to pass their own tobacco control laws relating to the sale of products so um, and then 1194, this one is related to driver's license issued to operators. This is basically a graduated driver's license bill. Versions of a graduated driver's license bill has been attempted in many um, sessions um, for I've been here 20 years and I can remember it in almost every session. So this bill did not pass, but but it could have been beneficial because graduated driver's license systems are really designed to provide new drivers of motor vehicles with driving experience and skills gradually over time um, in low risk environments, thereby saving lives. So um, we are we are. Um, we do support graduated driver's license, but do also understand, um, you know, um, probably why this one didn't pass. So, next slide, please. 
The next one is Senate Bill 2121 that did not pass. This would this was the primary seatbelt law. Um, this again is not the first time we see, saw this. This was um, has been in previous sessions. This of course would have allowed law enforcement to stop a driver for not wearing a seatbelt, as opposed to right now it's secondary enforcement, which we all know if you get pulled over for speeding and you don't have your seatbelt on, then they can fine you for that, but they can't pull you over if they see you don't have a seatbelt um, on. On. Um, we provided supportive testimony to this bill because it really, we know that research shows that primary seatbelt laws do increase seatbelt usage, which saves lives. Um, the next one is 1148. This was related to the requirements for e-bikes. And so this one is kind of weird because it's not that it didn't pass because it did pass, but we put it here because um, it's it's possible that someone might want to add helmets to other parts of the e-bike law. So what happened when this bill, um, we got to give huge kudos to Don Mayer, who's our injury prevention um, person who was watching this bill. She really recognized early on that these e-bikes could have a potential for injury because they can go up to speeds up to 28 miles an hour for like a class three. You can see at the bottom of this slide, we put some additional information so you can see what the different classes are. And so we did provide testimony on this on the safety aspects. And we did also um, request that age restrictions be put on the bill, um, but that did not pass. And um, they did include helmet use, but only for class three. Um, and so that would have been beneficial um, for the other classes as well, because without age requirements on this now, you could technically have somebody, you know, seven, eight year old that's on an e-bike and some of these e-bikes do go up to 28 miles an hour. So that is pretty fast um, for a young kid to be on an e-bike, especially with no helmets. So we got a little bit of a win with this, but didn't get it as far as we wanted. Next slide, Clint. Um, the other um, bill that did not pass that would have been very beneficial would have been um, Senate Bill 2235. That was related to the creation of a school nurse grant program. And again, in 20 years that I've been here, um, school nursing bills have um, come up in many shapes and forms over, over the years. This one would have provided the health department with a grant of $2.25 million to award 10 part-time and 10 full-time nurse um, grants to eligible schools. And then it did turn into a study, but in the end, <clears throat> it didn't pass. And of course, it just would have been beneficial because we know that school nurses perform very critical roles, ro um, a role in the school. Um, luckily, however, with a grant that Nicole Burnell and her section is going to be um, um, looking at is one of those ELC grants that Brenda talked about in the in the beginning. It's going to be a grant that's going to focus on testing in K-12. We are going to be able to use some of that funding to be able to offer schools um, either funding if they don't have school nursing services to use this funding to establish school nursing or to enhance school nursing that they currently have um, with the caveat that that school nurse would be intimately involved and need to set up a testing strategy for COVID in those schools. So didn't pass, but we do feel we have some additional funding in another avenue where we're gonna be able to get some nurses into schools. I think, is that my last slide, Clint? Yes, it was. Okay. Um, any, questions for Kim? That, <laughs> any questions? Hey, Kim, I have a question. I don't know if it would be for you or for Kelly, but you know that Senate Bill 2303, when the when the tribe was looking at creating a, a local public health unit, um, I know that, um, well, I don't know how many years ago this was, on the Health Council, we had created some administrative rules um, to define what a local public health unit was. And my understanding is it was sent to the AG's office um, and the rules were returned um, because it, uh, it exceeded the department's authority to be able to create those. And I believe there were some folks on your team that were gonna be reviewing those um, to try to resubmit. Do you have any updates on that? Or do I'm gonna you let Dr. Kelly jump in on that question. Sure. Yeah, so I'll jump in on that question. You're, you're very accurate. 
uh, we walked through the process of rulemaking um, in alignment with the health council's um, wishes. And when we got to the step where the uh, attorney general's office reviews um, the legality of that, we were informed that that creating rules that we were trying to create was beyond the scope of, of what we could do. And so really what we had been informed by the attorney general's office was, was that that process needed to happen through the legislative process and not the rulemaking process since it's outside of our scope. And so that, that's sort of the avenue that we're going to need to tackle moving forward is how to make that part of a legislative request rather than going through administrative rules. So, so that was my understanding from the attorney general's office. So I'll ask this question so Jenny doesn't have to. Um, it was outside of our scope. Where's the where was the line in that scope, or what what caused it to be a trigger versus the other rulemakings that we had done in the past? So the, tr the trigger that happened was um, it was essentially we were tying activities toward funding and, and creation of local public health units, and they thought that that was beyond the authority that we could do with the Department of Health. So, Dirk, is that going to be um, a, um, a goal or an initiative from the Department of Health to move forward with those? Because I do remember when we created those administrative rules, we worked with the local public health units. We also worked with the Department of Health. And I, I think we as a health council felt those were, um, it was a, a great piece of, of administrative rules to move forward and to help with that definition. Um, do you know what the intent is of the Department of Health to be able to move something like that forward then to the legislative section? Yeah, and I think that is our ultimate intent is to kind of revisit that. We want to make sure that uh, local public health is still good with the rules and, and if there's any additional tweaks or adjustments that need to be made, that's probably something that we're going to have to navigate uh, before the next legislative session. But then at that point, we'd want to find some a legislative champion to kind of formalize that. And, and it's a little bit different process than administrative rules, but it's it's how do we get to the same outcome? Uh, but we want to kind of do that collaboratively with local public health. So not just coming from the health department, um, it would come from us, local public health. We'd have hopefully health council's backing and then hopefully a legislative sponsor. And so it's, it's a big, strong package that this is what we want to do moving forward. And so I think that would be our avenue over the next um, kind of biennium to see how we do that. Okay, I appreciate that you guys are going to keep your pulse on that because I do know just visiting with local public health units as well as the SATRO director, I know that that was something that um, they felt strongly about as well. So I'm glad to hear you guys are going to look at moving forward with that. Well, thank you, Kim. And Kimberly and Kelly and all of those who contributed to uh, this particular area of subject matter for the State Health Council and, and the legislature. We appreciate your efforts on all of these bills. Thank you. Thank you. Tim, health resources response. Thanks, Dirk. Uh, so first slide, Clint. With the EMS division, we had 2133 that basically had two main components. Uh, one of those was to uh, establish EMS providers in what originally started as a pilot program called community paramedics uh, is uh, to now create the administrative rules uh, for a broader range than just paramedics serving in this newly defined category of community service. So these are EMS providers that wouldn't necessarily be doing traditional ambulance service, so to speak, but would be providing services that are defined as community uh, levels of services. Uh, usually these are extensions of, of healthcare systems uh, to be able to do outreach uh, within the communities uh, in underserved areas. Uh, the second major area uh, that this bill uh, covered was to permit the delivery of patients into uh, non-hospital environments. Uh, and the uh, intent of this was to create greater opportunities for telehealth uh, as part of that process. Uh, the second bill, 1493, 
uh, includes now air ambulance services as uh, eligible under the uh, EMS grant uh, operating uh, grant system that, that exists. Uh, next slide, Clinton. Uh, regarding the uh, the next uh, this next set, uh, there was a introduction of a bill that was intended to set up a distribution mechanism of Canadian acquired drugs that we would have taken into the health department's uh, warehouse system. Frankly, the state medical cash uh, that we use for the EMS. I'm sorry, for the emergency response work uh, and to redistribute those drugs uh, since we are a, a North Dakota licensed uh, pharmaceutical wholesaler, uh, there seemed to be a fit there uh, with the idea of trying to leverage the lower costs of those Canadian prescriptions uh, and make them available to pharmacies within North Dakota. Uh, this bill did not pass. Uh, there was a concern that was expressed by, uh, by industry and also by the uh, Canadian provinces. Uh, next slide. Uh, this series, the first one uh, on 2226, uh, let me grab my notes here real quick. So the, the first one establishes a new type of health uh, facility, and uh, this would deliver hospice care uh, in a facility setting other than a home. So this would establish a facility that would have nursing and food services and so forth, uh, but hospice care rendered in that environment. The concept is to uh, create an environment where kind of those daily living activities wouldn't have to occur or detract from the hospice uh, interaction uh, with with the residents of that facility. Uh, and so that will be a new category of licensure that, that we'll be doing uh, within the health department. The 2334, uh, does a similar thing. It establishes a new category of health facility. Uh, and this is for uh, patients that have received uh, care in an extended, say, a same day surgical center. Uh, but if they needed to stay overnight, uh, and obviously that's not an option in an extended, in a surgical center, this would create something other than a hospital uh, to allow that to occur. And uh, so that bill uh, also did pass, and we'll be establishing that. Uh, for 2145, uh, there uh, is a formal recognition now of essential caregivers in long term care settings. And so these are typically uh, family members or others that have been identified to, to provide these services. I think there was a lot of discussion uh, around uh, gaining access during the COVID lockdowns. Uh, so the visitation and that family uh, contact could be maintained in this environment. Uh, I know that there was uh, some controversy in terms of the passage of this, this law doesn't impact the CMS provisions. Uh, and so CMS would still be controlling in terms of the eligibility of the reimbursement. Uh, and uh, so if in fact there is a, a difference, uh, CMS ultimately uh, controls because of the reimbursement processes. Uh, but this is a, a category that, that is uh, being established. Uh, uh, there was also um, an addition of undocumented children to this bill uh, and the recognition that uh, the facility would need to have a, a formal recognition uh, from state government relative to uh, the acceptance of undocumented children in, in their care. Uh, for 1065, uh, this was a bill dealing with long-term care um, moratorium and basically just raised our 25% uh, cap on the number of beds that could be held uh, to 30%. Uh, and this deals with some of the work that was happening with human services around rate setting. Uh, but in terms of the impact on the health department, again, it just deals with raising that from a 25% bed, 25% of the beds to 30%. Um, there is uh, some concern we, we though are seeing that the passage of this law is, does not synchronize with the federal CMS requirements about the, the kind of windows in which those beds can be changed. 
Uh, so it gets a little bit complex, uh, but but if we go from, I'm sorry, I skipped ahead to 1332. That's where the discrepancies are occurring. So in 1332, we went from one time a year now to two times a year in being able to to shift the number of beds that are being held. Uh, but now there's a discrepancy between what the federal requirement is uh, and the state requirement. And so we're gonna have to be uh, you know, just you know, really clear that the state law change uh, doesn't impact the eligibility of the CMS requirements uh, you know, for payment. So uh, there will still be um, a restriction on the, the timeframes as opposed, imposed by the, by the federal government. Um, and then finally, uh, there was uh, a next slide. Uh, bill uh, that was uh, introduced regarding life safety and construction, and it established uh, time frames uh, for which the uh, life safety and construction review of initial plans uh, needed to be completed, and uh, they're basically establishing there's establishing three different categories: uh, less than a million dollars, uh, then one million to uh, four million, and then another category of, of four greater than four million. So, the initial plan review needs to be completed for less than a million within 28 days, in the category of one to four million, 42 days, and greater than four million, 56 days. It then also provided uh, some flexibility in terms of of how we can utilize third-party reviewers that we contract with. Uh, and so that we can control the uh, basically the workload of our limited staff uh, so that we can stay within these parameters uh, and utilize third party reimbursers, I'm sorry, third party re reviewers that are then paid for by the uh, owner operator that would be paying directly for those third party reviews. Uh, and then our role in those situations is that our the life safety construction staff then does a a review of what the third party reviewer did. So it's an oversight uh, of uh, a third party reviewer that we would have under contract. Um, these uh, we have two of them in place currently, and these tend to be large firms that that can draw on a number of resources. So when we start to have a buildup. Uh, more work that, that can be accomplished within these time frames that we can expand into these third party uh, reviewers so that we can control uh, the time frames in which these projects are are completed. Uh, so I believe that was my last slide and I'd be happy to stand for any questions. Thank you, Tim. Uh, and I'll be tackling licensure and certification. So Clint, if you can move to the next slide. So for uh, medical marijuana, we did touch on these, uh, a couple of these, the last meeting that we had, uh, but for House Bill 1073, this was relating to criminal history record checks. So what had happened when uh, DQ separated, uh, you needed to have two different uh, statutes or codes relating to what could be approved for criminal history record check. And so this bill did separate DEQ from DOH. And so we, we just retained what we had before. Uh, we didn't gain anything new. It just separated DEQ from DOH's uh, criminal history re record check, um, what's allowable. Um, House Bill 1213, this was our cleanup bill for medical marijuana. Uh, it allowed for a timelier issuance of designated caregiver card when a patient was terminal or had a terminal illness. Um, it also helped identify ownership changes. We've, we've experienced that a couple of times in the biennium where an ownership uh, was changed or transferred. And so this just made it more efficient and effective. And then it, it allowed the program the ability to reduce application and registration fees as well. Uh, House Bill 1359, uh, this removed the caregiver fee. It allowed up to five designated caregivers as well, and it changed the membership of the advisory board. And so in terms of the designated caregivers, there, there were circumstances where um, there may be a child who, who is a um, 
participant in the medical marijuana program and, and that relationship may be with the parents may be a split relationship in terms of a divorce. And so this would allow the both of them to be designated caregivers. So that would be one example where this would be a smart change instead of just having that one designated caregiver. In terms of the fees, the, the patients still have to pay the, the fee that's associated with uh, medical marijuana. So the caregiver fees on top of it, uh, we thought that that might have been uh, limiting the amount of caregivers that were a part of the program. And so we wanted to make sure that that option was available to those that needed it. Um, in terms of the changing of the membership, uh, the membership now includes uh, two legislative um, individuals who would be, who will be brought forward by legislative management. Um, the state health officer is still the chairman of, of the committee. Uh, there'll be another member from the Department of Health as well. There'll be a representative from the manufacturing and dispensaries. There'll be a member uh, from the patient side. There'll be a healthcare provider and there'll also be a pharmacist. So that'll be what the board is created of uh, moving forward. Um, Senate Bill 2123, this was relating to uh, death records. And so this really just added a genetic sibling as to the list of people who can request a full death record. Uh, next slide, Clint. Uh, some bills that did not pass. Uh, House Bill 1391 was in related to edibles, and this would have been adding edible products to uh, the medical marijuana program. Uh, this is a repeat bill, so I, I do expect it to come up again next session. Uh, House Bill 1420, this would have been the bill that would have made adult use cannabis program for the state of North Dakota. That would have been regulated by the Department of Health as well. Um, I would expect that this comes back in some form or fashion, whether it's an initiated measure or um, a future bill like this, um, because I know that there's, there's still that push uh, moving forward, but that did fail in the Senate. Um, Senate Bill 2234, this was relating to home grow. And so this would have added home grow as an option um, for those in the medical marijuana program. This is probably one of the more significant concerns we have with the within the medical marijuana program is the option of home grow. It really increases the amount of diversion that's possible in the state. Um, the product is no longer tested. And so the safety um, limits are, are in question. And, and just having kind of walked through this process for the past couple of years, uh, the amount of, of different things that can be put into a ma uh, marijuana product and how that can impact somebody in a um, kind of a weakened state it is very concerning. So I'm, I'm glad that this this bill was did fail. I do expect this to repeatedly keep coming back up because this is sort of um, kind of a a keystone issue for for um, the people that that really want this option. Uh, vital records is Senate Bill 2163. This bill was actually withdrawn from consideration. Uh, Judy, uh, Senator Lee did reach out um, before the session and just talked about the desire to have provisional vital event data released um, through the vital records uh, program. And when we looked at, at the options, we were able to handle this through just a change in our policy. And so we did do that change and so uh, we just need to make sure that the information is marked as provisional uh, because it, it does take a significant amount of time to get all the vital record information of a given year into the system. And so uh, there was concern that um, from our end in terms of our vital records team that that information would be changing. And so um, that's that's kind of similar with a lot of our information is, is if it's provisional, that is subject to change. And so just by noting that, we think that we kind of um, made a nice compromise for both sides. Uh, next issue. And so these last couple bills uh, for food and lodging, the 1103 and the 2119, uh, they were both um, house cleaning bills, um, really allowed um, some clarification in language and it allowed some more flexibility in terms of compliance. Um, one of the things that, that was happening is there was some duplication in terms of federal and state um, review. And so this, this just allows some some kind of regulatory easing so they're not being uh, uh, assessed twice. Um, and lastly, the Senate Bill 2252, which was in regards to purified water dispensers. So this bill would have required food and lodging to coordinate a program to test water and water dispensers in retail settings. 
uh, we didn't really see a significant public health uh, risk or benefit. So uh, we were glad that uh, we didn't have this put on our plate as well. And with that, I believe our next slide is the thank you. And so I'll take any questions about those bills or any, if there's any questions about anything in general in terms of legislative session, this would be a good time to tackle those. Any questions? Hearing none, um, yeah, thank you to Dirk, to, to you for leading this effort and for stepping in in the interim as, as our health officer um, through this process. And uh, thank you to, to Brenda for all that she does as well. So your administrative staff has, has been working really hard lately along with all of the people that we, we know are connected with the uh, public emergencies. So we appreciate it. Um, thank you. Yeah, and, and uh, I'm glad you called out Brenda because she was really like point lead of, of what happened in the legislative process. And so I always want to give her a um, special shout out because of the amount of work and effort that goes into that. So thank you. All right. The next thing on the agenda is a state health officer update. Uh, Dirk, would you like to introduce the new state health officer? Uh, sure. Uh, Dr. Wiebe has been here for uh, a grand total of 11 days. Uh, this is the 12th day. He started on, on May 1st. I would say that although that's the timeline that, that's on his, his work-related history for the Department of Health, he actually started significantly earlier than that. Yeah, and he Once he was hired, he, he reached out to the Department of Health team. I know that he and I had monthly or weekly meetings for a month or two beforehand. Uh, I think he did the same with Brenda and then he reached out to all of our leadership team, had individual meetings. And so um, I believe he'll probably touch on his background, but but to me that that's the core information that people should wanna know is he was willing to to reach out early and often and make sure that that he connected with our team and that he was being collaborative um, and invested in our team. And so to me, that shows the, the type, of, type of state health officer that we got. And in the first two weeks, it's been more of the same. So I'm, I'm immensely grateful that he's joined our team and uh, very excited about where we're gonna go. And so with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Wiebe. Yeah, th thank you, Dirk. And uh, good morning, uh, everyone. Good morning uh, to the uh, uh, Health Council uh, uh, and uh, Chair Poole. Uh, I'm really excited and thrilled to be joining uh, the Department of Health in uh, North Dakota. And officially, I started May 1st, uh, which was a Saturday. So officially started uh, the following Monday. Uh, but uh, one thing that uh, I'd, I'd like to mention and I, I'm really thrilled about is that uh, I'm really amazed and impressed uh, with the team in the Department of Health. Uh, so uh, from the time uh, during my interview process and, and meetings, uh, I met with the leadership team. They were involved in, in the interviewing process. And uh, once I accepted the position, as Dirk mentioned, I was uh, meeting with uh, many of the leadership team members, as well as with Dirk on a weekly basis and uh, Brenda. And every time I interact with them and after arriving here, uh, it just, uh, I'm, I'm really thrilled with the kind of like level of expertise, dedication, uh, trustworthiness uh, that uh, they exhibit. And I'm uh, sure that they have been working uh, extra hard, especially in the last 15 months uh, during the pandemic, and uh, I mean, uh, there are the, the the proof is evident uh, to their dedication and hard work. So here, I would also like to thank Dirk, uh, especially uh, as well as Brenda and every single uh, member of the team, uh, those who presented, as well as uh, everyone else in the department. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll just uh, maybe share a couple items about my background and how I ended up uh, here in Bismarck. And then I'll uh, kind of like would like to, to uh, uh, maybe have it as an open conversation or dialogue to, to see what is uh, on your mind or some questions in particular or in specifics that I can uh, address. 
so a little bit about uh, uh, the, the background. Uh, I am a physician by training and I work in uh, internal medicine uh, in hospital as well as in ambulatory care. Uh, and then I kind of like switched to working in uh, cancer research. And the reason being is uh, when I was doing uh, treatment and clinical medicine, uh, I was always thinking that, well, why are we waiting till this point where we interact with a person who is sick or ill or has some kind of like a condition and then trying to provide the treatment and the diagnosis. Wouldn't it be maybe more effective, more efficient to uh, focus on the preventative side or kind of try to uh, catch disease in a very early stage? So that was one of the reasons I switched to cancer research because the, the focus at that time that I was involved in is um, early detection of bladder cancer and prostate cancer. Uh, so many times we uh, receive or a patient comes when they are already advanced in prostate cancer or bladder cancer. And this research team that I joined was focusing on how to really uh, detect that cancer when it is at a very, very, very early stage of the disease before it becomes uh, hard to treat. Uh, I also got interested in, in strategic planning and business development, so I was working in that field with the Academic Medical Center in Nebraska. Uh, so this uh, Academic Medical Center is considered a, a, a big size or a large hospital uh, slash academic medical center that uh, had 650 beds, uh, and it is affiliated with the University of Nebraska Medical Center. Uh, that also was a great opportunity that allowed me to get exposure to the uh, field of providing services to patients in inpatient setting as well as in ambulatory care. Uh, and I was in, involved in the strategic plan of the overall uh, hospital as well as in specific service lines, uh, cancer as well as neurology uh, and um, cardiovascular. Uh, so then for the last uh, 10, uh, 11 years, I was asked to join the College of Public Health at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And in that capacity for the last 11 years, I wore multiple hats. Uh, one of the hats that I wore was uh, directing the Center for Health Policy. So this, there is a, a center that we have established within the university to provide policy analysis for legislators. Uh, so in Nebraska, we have a unicameral, uh, but the senators uh, that are attempting to introduce a specific bill, they come to us uh, asking for the analysis to provide the argument for their bills. Uh, a, a good example is uh, one of the senators wanted to introduce a bill to increase tobacco tax, for example, uh, because Nebraska was one of the states that has a very low level of uh, tobacco tax compared to other states. So he came to us and told us, well, I have this idea, uh, help me with the analysis. So we provide the information about, well, what does that mean when it comes to revenues? Uh, because of that increase in uh, tax. Uh, what does it mean when it comes to the tobacco cessation? Because we also know that young age uh, smokers uh, are very sensitive to price and you usually increase the price a little bit and then all of a sudden a big chunk, a substantial chunk of smokers will quit smoking or reduce the level of smoking. And the third aspect is, well, what does that mean to the burden of disease? Because we know smoking causes cancer and emphysema and COPD and all of this adds to the burden on the state, especially if you do not have um, insurance, 
uh, or if there are any other complications as well as secondhand smoke. So it's kind of like a, a whole uh, slew of, of uh, activities. So we usually provide this kind of analysis. Uh, the other hat that I uh, also wore was uh, being involved in teaching uh, uh, health policy, U.S. healthcare system, uh, as well as human resources. And as probably you already know, uh, the healthcare system in the United States is kind of like interesting and uh, uh, a good description uh, of it is that it is fragmented. And many times this continuum of care affects us as citizens, as, as human beings, because when you are trying to provide services uh, to your citizens, the, this fragmentation uh, inhibits or kind of like is a challenging aspect of the continuum of care. Uh, whether you are, even if you are taking uh, or a patient going from one hospital to the other, or is being discharged from a hospital to a long-term care facility. Uh, the same thing when we, it is the interaction between uh, health and human services and how to ensure that there is continuation of maybe health insurance, continuation of services. Uh, so uh, I have done this work for the last uh, 11 years and I was really thrilled when the opportunity presented and uh, I was being, uh, you know, we were in discussions to come to North Dakota. I got to kind of learn more about uh, the great work that the state has been uh, doing uh, when it comes to health, uh, as well as the various initiatives and then the fresh look that many of the North Dakotans have uh, to health as well as the collaboration aspect. Um, now, I know that it's, uh, I'm, I'm kind of like, uh, got the impression when I visited North Dakota that the collaborative spirit is uh, strong and I still see it in very aspects uh, across the state. Uh, of course, that's, I mean, sometimes there are differences of opinion, uh, but I think this is a fertile ground uh, to move health to a higher level. Uh, also, I mean, I, I also was impressed with how kind and nice people are uh, in North Dakota. So that's always uh, really very refreshing. Um, and I hear the weather is a little bit colder, but I'm used to cold weather in Nebraska uh, anyway. So, uh, so anyway, so uh, that's kind of like uh, a short, uh, summary of what I have done, and I hope it is of uh, interest. Uh, and I would like to kind of like uh, maybe open it uh, more to a dialogue or if uh, any members of the council have questions or anything that I can uh, answer. Uh, now, of course, uh, the, the challenging part is that I've been on the job for uh, really like, I would say six working days uh, there is still a lot to learn, uh, so I will try to share uh, my my uh, impression as as best as I could. Well, welcome on board. We're, we appreciate you being here. We appreciate your experience, your background, and you bringing that to help serve the people of North Dakota. Thank you. And and uh, this is Daryl Birch and and Dwayne. I certainly uh, agree. Welcome. It's nice to have your your background and experiences, and hopefully, can use that to apply to how healthcare is delivered and received in North Dakota because it is a two way street. I think you'll find that uh, if you haven't already, the health department has uh, a great staff mm -hmm. that uh, can and has led us through this pandemic and as we have reacted to that, but there's also really good things happening at the health department with preventative services as well. And you've probably seen some of that work. I think you'll find as well that providers are very engaged in the transition from volume to value as well, which includes um, the work that's needed with preventative health and, and helping folks through transitions of care. There are providers that are associated or participating in Medicare um, ACO programs, 
There's commercial PCO programs and all to which uh, fall in line with what you're talking about with prevention and the coordination of care through transition. So welcome again. Thank you, thank you. Anyone else? I, I will say this, Dr. Webby. I, I've been fortunate and I've been around the, the state health department and my wife had worked with them previously. And um, so I, and I've been on this now for about, or have been on the committee for about 10 years. And you are inheriting a very competent and very humble staff. Um, they don't ring their own bell loud enough in my opinion. And, and I hope you're a champion for them as well. So. Yeah, thank you. I, I totally agree and I have experienced that from the very first interaction uh, with the, the team member. And I hope that uh, together with the team, uh, we can kind of like promote the good thing and present uh, and make it more visible uh, and uh, capitalize on, on that. And in the end of the day, uh, our focus is always on North Dakotans and the citizens of North Dakota, how to provide services and how to elevate the level of quality. So then we are providing better and uh, uh, higher quality services. And I will say that this conversation right now might be a little bit muted, partly in the sense that um, all of us are officially resigned tomorrow and, and we really don't have any idea as to who might be um, returning to the council. And so the engagement here might be a little bit odd compared to how it would normally be <laughs> in, in a circumstance where, where there was con or known continuities. But uh, I'm sure several of the people that are on this call will, will also be back on this, this committee as well. And uh, I will say this for the health council members, they represent their industries very well. They represent the consumers very well. And they have in, in their mind and in their service on this committee that I've experienced um, nothing but the best of intentions for the the people of North Dakota. Sure. So. All right. Is okay. you like to is there, are there any other updates, Dr. Weeby or uh, that's kind of like that is uh, at, at this point, uh, I think it would be a kind of like an introduction and uh, hopefully we'll have the chance to kind of like uh, converse as well as uh, to get uh, uh, deeper conversations uh, with uh, in the near future. Yeah, I would encourage you that as uh, the governor reappoints people to the to the council that you reach out and introduce yourself to these people. Um, they bring a lot to you and I think they're a resource for you. Absolutely, thank you. So, uh, to the council members, any other business or old business to revisit? Okay. Um, on on the subject of, of resignations, um, this will be my my last day on the health council. I am not um, going to reapply. I have probably put more than enough time on the health council. That's probably a good time with the. Uh, renewal of the health council under a new uh, uh, division and all of the changes that are likely to happen. It's a, I think it's a good time to bring in new blood anyway and fresh blood. And um, so I will be saying thank you very much for uh, allowing me to, to work with you and uh, appreciate everything you guys have done. Dwayne, thank you. I appreciate working with you as a health council member as well. Um, I think we've served pretty much almost coinciding, I think, as, as members. Um, I, too, will be resigning from the health council and appreciate everybody's efforts over the years and what we've done. And I do wish the staff at the Department of Health um, all, all well wishes. Um, you guys have been an awesome staff to work with. Um, supporting us and as well as supporting the citizens and uh, in the state of North Dakota with health. You guys are an awesome group and I wish you the best and hope our paths cross in other areas as well. So thank you. Well, and I just wanted to say thank you to um, both of you for the work that you've done as chairs of the health council. Because when I started, Jenny, you were the, you were the chair of the health council and and Dwayne had to uh, 
fill those shoes and, and he's done so well. So it's nice to get to know all of you on the health council. I'll say this, if any of you are in Bismarck, let me know. I'm more than happy to have a cup of coffee or a, <laughs> a glass of wine with any of you. So please say hello. All right, if there's no further business in front of this council, seeing no further business, we'll adjourn this meeting of the North Dakota State Health Council. Thank you very much, everybody, for your service. Thank you, staff, for your presentations, hard work that went into this, and thank you, Dr. Weeby for joining this incredible team at the state of North Dakota.